Annie's Faith Amish Romance Secrets, Book Two Written by Samantha Price Narrated by Susanna Coleman Chapter One And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28 It's my entire fault, Kate thought as she buried her head in the soft, downy pillow. If I hadn't brought Liz into my parents' house, this never would have happened. Normally, Kate was lulled to sleep by Benjamin's rhythmic snoring, but tonight, sleep was escaping her. She considered that the only black spot in her life right now was that her good friend Liz was taking Jessie's attention away from her sister, Annie. It's clear that Annie and Jessie are perfect for each other, she thought. Yet what chance does the no-makeup-wearing, plain-clothed Annie have against Liz, who always wears those tight-fitting English clothes? I know Annie loves Jessie, that's clear enough and I'm sure he was starting to return her love until Liz showed up. Now, all Jessie's attention seems to be taken up with Liz. Kate's mind drifted to all the things that had happened in her own life over the past year. In that time, Kate had married the love of her life, Benjamin, and they were living happily in the little white house that Benjamin had built for her on the edge of his farm. They had both made the little cottage into a simple and fully functioning home for themselves. Benjamin had several pieces of furniture that his grandfather had made, and Kate had lovingly made one of her quilts for their bed. Every morning, Kate forced herself out of bed and worked hard in the vegetable garden. After tending the garden, Kate would go to work in the tailor's shop with Rebecca. Rebecca had become more than her boss. She had become a close friend. Kate was thankful that she was still able to work at the tailor's after marrying, but she wondered how she would still manage to work there after she had a baby. Not that she was expecting yet, but she hoped to be very soon. Kate rolled over, trying not to wake Benjamin. As always, Benjamin, like most Amish men, had to wake at first light to fulfill his workload for the day. A little smile crept across Kate's face as she realized how truly blessed she was. She was married to the best man in the world, still able to work outside of the community, and Benjamin made her feel like the most wonderful woman. The icing on her cake would be to have the blessing of a baby and then her world would become even more perfect and complete. Kate wanted Annie to get married so that Annie would be as happy as she herself was. Kate wondered how she could help make it happen. Annie would never show Jesse that she liked him, but maybe it would be better if she did make her interest known to him. Sometimes men just need a little prod in the right direction. Kate wondered if she should have Benjamin talk to Jesse, his brother, to see where his affection lay. But then Kate remembered that Benjamin did not approve of meddling in the affairs of others. However, Kate wasn't. Not when it came to her sister's happiness. Kate knew what it felt like to be in love with a man and to pretend that the love was not there. Kate often sent up a silent prayer of thanks to God that Benjamin and she had finally gotten together despite all the obstacles that had been set in their path. Kate's head spun as she thought of her friend, her sister, and her brother-in-law. She knew she had to get some sleep because she would be of no use at work tomorrow if she didn't. Her eyes had to be fully rested if she was to do the fine hand stitching required by the beaded gowns she sewed. Unable to sleep, Kate's thoughts returned to the conversation earlier that day between herself and her best friend, Liz. Liz had been born into the Amish community, but had left when she was 16. The only time she had come back was to stay, temporarily, with Kate's parents, as she had nowhere else to go. Kate, thank you so much for letting me stay at your parents' place. I'm so grateful to you and your parents. I know I've stayed much longer than I thought, but I should be gone soon. Kate could never say no to her dear friend, but in trying to help her friend, it looked very much like she had ruined things for Annie. Kate was sitting at her large wooden table folding the clothes that she had just gotten off the clothesline. Anytime, Liz, you know that. Besides, you get on great with everyone. Mom and Dad love having you here. I'll finish folding these and then get us something to eat. Liz started to help Kate fold the clothes. I will be leaving in about two weeks, I'd say. Kate nodded and wondered if that were really true. It was not the first time that she had heard Liz say that she would be leaving in about two weeks. The new job starts in two weeks and as soon as I get paid, I'll rent a place, Liz said. Take as long as you need, Kate said as she took advantage of their private moment. Liz, I have to ask you something. Liz looked up from the folding that she was doing. What is it? Sounds serious. Kate shrugged her shoulders. Maybe it is serious. 
Normally Kate didn't like to pry, but she just had to know how Liz felt about Jesse. Kate folded the last of the clothes and pushed them to the end of the table. Let's have some blueberry cake and some rolled oat cookies first, Kate said. Oh, goody. I love rolled oat cookies. You're such a good cook, Liz replied. Kate took the boiled kettle off the stove and carried the blueberry cake and cookies back down to the table. So, what I want to know is, do you like anyone here in the community? Like a man, I mean. Liz laughed. Yes, I kind of like someone and I'm pretty sure he likes me too, but time will tell. That was exactly what Kate had been afraid of. She cut the cake into slices. That's what I thought, Kate said. Am I that easy to read? How did you guess that I like an Amish man? Liz picked up a cookie and took a bite. I know you very well, dear Liz. Kate poured them both a cup of coffee. You're like a sister to me. Liz nodded and smiled at her. Mmm, these cookies are very good. Thank you. They're Benjamin's favorites, Kate replied as she took a sip of her coffee. Since you like an Amish man, do you think it would be better if you wore something a little, well, a little plain? Like the dress I made for you? Kate asked. Liz looked a little embarrassed and nodded. Most likely, but I couldn't make myself wear it. I'm sorry. It was so good of you to make it for me. I can't bring myself to wear anything like that anymore. And to be truthful, it brings back memories of being trapped in this community. Kate thought that it was odd for Liz to refer to being trapped in the community because she had willingly stayed at her parents' house for over a year now. That's all right. If you aren't going to wear it, then maybe you could give it to Annie. She's probably due for a new dress. Kate figured that if Liz wasn't going to wear the dress, then someone should be getting use out of it. Kate had been brought up never to waste anything. Liz was immediately agreeable. Yes, good idea. I'll give it to Annie. You're not upset with me, are you? No, of course I'm not upset. But your Amish man might like to see you wear something a little plainer than the clothes you usually wear. You don't want to scare him away, Kate replied. Liz nodded. I will give it some thought then. More coffee? Liz nodded again. Yes, please. Kate poured Liz another cup of coffee. Now tell me who your Amish man is. She was pretty sure it was Jesse. I don't want to say anything because I don't want to jinx it. Liz's tone was quite firm. Kate screwed up her nose and realized that Liz no longer thought like the Amish. That was a very English thing to say. Kate only knew what the word jinx meant because she'd lived amongst the English for some time. It was a word that the Amish most certainly would never use as it is something they don't believe in at all. Jinxing implies that things are left to chance or some other sort of power. However, the Amish know that everything is in God's hands and that he is in charge of all things. Kate took another sip of coffee and then placed the mug carefully back on the table. That's all right, don't tell me. I've got a pretty good idea who it is anyway. Liz giggled like a little girl. Do you now? Kate nodded. Well, you'll just have to wait and see whether you are correct or not, won't you? Liz said between giggles. If you're not going to tell me, then I guess I will have to wait. No waiting is needed, Kate thought. It's Jessie for sure. What other reason would she have for not telling me? It can only be because Jessie is Benjamin's brother. Kate tossed in the bed once more, pleased that Benjamin was a sound sleeper. If Liz had worn the dress I made for her, I wonder if Jessie would have paid her as much attention. It's obvious that Annie and Jessie are a perfect match for each other. They get on so well and have so much in common. Hopefully, somehow his attention will be drawn back to the good-hearted Annie. Kate considered herself to be in a most difficult position. Both her best friend and her sister were in love with the same man. She would like nothing better than to have her sister Annie marry her brother-in-law, Jesse. But Liz deserved happiness as well. Kate felt as if her heart were torn. She wanted them both to be happy, but there was only one Jesse. As tempting as it is, I must not meddle. I have to leave it in God's hands, Kate thought as she snuggled into Benjamin's broad and very warm back, breathing in his warm, familiar scent. At that very same moment, Annie was also unable to sleep, as thoughts of Jesse were very much on her mind as well. She had often noticed him looking at Liz. It hurt her that his attention could be swayed by the physical, the outside looks of a person, rather than what was on the inside. Surely purity, honesty, and a good heart matter for something, she thought. I will put my heart in God's hands and let him find me a man who truly loves me. I hope it is Jesse. With that silent prayer, Annie pushed thoughts of Jesse right out of her mind, confident that God would work things out for her one way or another, and she closed her eyes and got some much-needed sleep. 
Chapter 2 While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Genesis 8.22 Annie's peace of mind was short-lived. It wasn't that Annie didn't like Liz. In fact, she liked her very much, and they had become very good friends. That was what made it all the more difficult when Jessie showed Liz attention. She couldn't be mad at the sweet-natured Liz. After all, it wasn't her fault that Jessie was besotted with her. He's never shown me attention like that. How could I possibly compete with her? Liz wears makeup and fashionable English tight-fitting clothes. How can I possibly match that? Liz's hair was bleached blonde with handsome, fine light brown highlights. By contrast, Annie couldn't even show off her lustrous, shiny, dark, almost black hair that she had inherited from her dad's side of the family. She had to hide it under her prayer cap. Annie had never minded until now. She was also sure that Liz wore false eyelashes, as it was unnatural for a person to have eyelashes so thick and lush. No matter which way Annie looked at it, she felt that she just didn't measure up. For the first time, Annie looked into the little mirror compact that she'd smuggled into the house without her dad's knowledge. Her dad's strict rules were that there would be no vanity in his house, and that meant no mirrors whatsoever. Reflected back to her from the little mirror, Annie noticed that her skin was smooth and a light creamy, honey color, which she thought emphasized her dark eyes nicely. In her mind, Annie compared her eyebrows to Liz's eyebrows and studied her own in her little mirror. Would anyone notice if I plucked those couple of stray hairs underneath the line of my brows? She wondered. Surely no one would notice. She picked up the tweezers and plucked those hairs right out, one by one. It didn't hurt as much as she suspected it might. Annie took one more look at herself before she hid the little compact mirror back under her pillow. This is the best I can look with no color to my face by the way of makeup, and without false lashes. Annie knew she was letting vanity creep into her life just a little, but what else was she to do if she was to compete with Liz to win Jessie's heart? Annie knocked on Liz's bedroom door. Come in, Liz called. Annie stuck her head around the door. It's just me. Can we talk? Annie could smell Liz's perfume as soon as she opened the door. It was a scent that Liz wore often. It smelled like a mixture of rose and honeysuckle. Everything about Liz was perfect. She even smelled perfect. Sure. I was just going to finish the end of this chapter and then I was going to come and find you. I've got something to tell you. Liz patted the end of the bed on the other side to where she was sitting. What's up? Annie tucked her legs under her and kneeled on the end of the bed. She noticed that Liz had hung another bright painting on the wall. Gone was the Amish quilt from Liz's bed. The room looked very different from the room in which Kate had grown up. You tell me first. No, it can wait. What's on your mind? Liz asked. Annie spread her dress out evenly over her legs and smoothed her hand over the silky texture of the shiny pink quilt. Can you tell me more of what it's like outside of the community? Annie asked. It's very different out there. Liz's eyes lighted up. You can do anything you want, anything at all, and there's no judgment from people and no parents, no bishop and no elders. It's freedom, complete freedom. Annie studied Liz's face as she talked. It was clear that Liz missed living amongst the English and was pleased to have what she called freedom. What about God's judgment? Liz looked thoughtful. I don't think that God judges every little thing we do. I think it's what's in the heart that's important, don't you? Annie thought for a while. She'd never heard such a thing. Everything has a consequence. Everything someone does causes something to happen. So surely a wrongdoing would have a suitable judgment of some sort, Liz said. Annie shook her head. I don't know. Well, that's what I think anyway, Liz said as she put the book she was reading face down on the bed next to her. And what about you? Are you going to go on Rumspringa like Kate did? Or are you going to stay here forever, never knowing what it's like outside the community? Liz asked her. No, I'm quite happy here and don't feel that I need to leave. I'm a little interested in what life is like away from the community, but don't think I'd ever like to leave, Annie replied. Annie studied Liz's face. The colors of the makeup on her face made her look very pretty indeed. Annie had to remind herself that the outside of a person did not matter so much, and that it is the inside that is important. Annie called to mind the scripture that the bishop had read at the last meeting, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, 
which is in the sight of God of great price. What is important is meekness and a good heart, Annie affirmed silently. Liz noticed Annie looking into her face. Are you looking at my makeup? Annie smiled. Yeah, it looks so pretty. Liz leapt off the bed and hurried over to her makeup, which was on the side table underneath the window. Let me do your makeup for you. I'll give you a total makeover. Annie laughed. No, no, I couldn't. It's not for me. I wouldn't feel right wearing it, but it looks good on you. Oh, please let me. You would look so beautiful. You've got such beautiful skin and I could really bring out your big brown eyes with a dash of mascara. You're so pretty already. You'd look amazing with makeup on. Annie shook her head. No, I can't really. Annie secretly felt pleased that Liz said that she looked pretty. No one had said such a thing to her before. Yet she couldn't possibly put that stuff on her face. What if her dad saw it? He would surely have a heart attack. Liz sat back on the bed. All right, I'm leaving soon, so you should take me up on my offer, Liz said. When are you going? Annie didn't want Liz to go. It would feel like Kate leaving all over again. Annie had become quite used to having Liz in the house. One thing Annie would be pleased about when Liz was gone would be that Jessie might start showing her some attention once more. While Liz was around, no one else seemed to get any sense out of him. In a few weeks' time after I start my new job, as soon as I save up enough money, I'm going to get an apartment. Liz stopped talking for a moment and stared at Annie. Why do you always wear that gray color? Annie shrugged her shoulders. I don't always wear this color. Sometimes I wear... Liz interrupted her. I know, a darker gray. Annie took a deep breath, almost a sigh. Yeah. I've seen some women wear purple lately. Why don't you wear purple? It would really bring out your eyes, Liz told her. Really? Annie hadn't given much thought to what she wore, but would certainly never think of wearing purple. I can't sew very well. I'll see if Kate can help me, Annie replied. I tell you what, I totally forgot about this dress that Kate made. Liz opened a drawer of the dresser and unwrapped a brown paper package. Kate made it for me, but I'm leaving soon, so I'll never wear it. Liz unwrapped the package to reveal a soft, yellow-colored Amish dress. You can have it if you like it. Oh, it's wonderful, just perfect. Annie clapped her hands. Kate said to give it to you. I thought I could wear it, but I can never wear anything Amish again. I couldn't even bring myself to try it on. Liz handed the dress to Annie. It looks just perfect, Annie repeated. Thank you, Liz. Liz sat back down on the bed. Okay, now my turn to tell you something. Annie changed the position of her legs and sat in an upright position with her legs over the edge of the bed. Go on. Liz took a deep breath and blurted out, I like an Amish man. She held her breath, waiting for Annie's reaction. Annie laughed. Oh, that's great. Perhaps Liz will return to the Amish after all, she thought. He's lovely. I think I'm in love, truly in love. Not like it was with my last boyfriend. It feels different, so different, Liz said. Who? Liz interrupted Annie. Don't ask me who it is. I'm not ready to tell anyone yet, and it's only early days. Very early days. Annie saw by the glow on Liz's face how truly in love she was with this man, whoever he was. I'm so happy for you. Thanks. I've already told Kate about it. She's pleased, too. I didn't know how you'd react. I'm so glad you're pleased for me. Annie was trying to take it all in. She was rather surprised that Liz would fall in love with an Amish man, as Liz had become so very English in her ways. She wouldn't fit with an Amish man, not with her false nails and eyelashes along with her heavily painted face. Liz would have to live in a plain house and wear plain clothes and no makeup or jewelry whatsoever. She wouldn't be able to have bright colors like she has in this bedroom, or have all her little cushions, ornaments, and paintings. Surely Liz would know these things having grown up Amish. I can't see her being a match to any Amish man, Annie thought. Of course I'm pleased for you. Of course. Annie hung the dress on one of the wooden clothes pegs behind the door, pleased to have a change of color other than the grays she always wore. Until Liz arrived to stay with her family at the house, Annie had hardly ever given any consideration to how she looked or what she wore. Annie stepped away from her clothes and then it struck her. The man who Liz had fallen in love with was surely Jesse. Annie felt such dizziness come over her that she sat down on her bed and tried to calm herself with deep breaths. Who else could it possibly be, she asked herself. That explains why she didn't tell me who it was. That also would explain why she wasn't sure whether I'd be happy for her or not. 
That's why she stayed here for so long, because Jessie is over here most days helping Dad with things. Chapter 3 Be thou exalted, Lord, in thine own strength. So will we sing and praise thy power. Psalm 21, 13 Annie debated walking straight back to Liz and asking her straight out whether she was in love with Jessie, but she figured what good would that do? If she was in love with Jessie and he with her, it will only make me feel much worse, she thought. Best I don't know and just put my trust in God to guide my life. God knows that finding a good man is important to me, and he will see that it is so. After all, in the Bible it says that if we trust, then God will give us what we ask. As difficult as it was, Annie did all her chores while doing her best to push thoughts of Liz and Jessie right out of her mind. She couldn't wait to escape to her little sanctuary, the barn. It was there that she could really think things through. She could also talk things over with Stanley, her favorite horse, the family's buggy horse. Annie often thought that Stanley was the only one who really understood her. Hello, Stanley, my old friend. Annie inhaled the smell of horses and fresh hay. Stanley stopped eating his hay and looked over his shoulder to face her. As he usually did, he stuck out his head to be scratched on the nose. Oh, Stanley, I wish my life was as uncomplicated as yours. Annie stroked his nose and ran her fingertips over the softness of his white muzzle. She planted a little kiss on the end of his nose. It appears that someone is in love with my Jessie. What will we do about that, Stanley? Stanley lowered his head so Annie could scratch him behind his ears. You don't care at all, do you? Are you listening to me, Stanley? A chilling wind swept through the open door of the barn, reminding Annie that winter was nearly here. The cold also was a stark reminder that the wedding season was approaching. She thought she would have been married by now, and married to Jessie. Well, that's not going to happen, she thought. It looks like that dream is one that will not be fulfilled. I thought he liked me at Kate's wedding, but I've seen no interest from him since. Come to think of it, that was around the time that Liz came to live with us as well. There you are, Annie. Annie swung around in the direction of the familiar voice. Her heart pounded until she realized that her last few thoughts, for once, had only been in her head and that she hadn't spoken them out aloud. However, that did not prevent her feeling awkward when she saw him. Jessie strode toward her. I thought I'd find you here. Yeah, with my best friend. Annie replied as she wished she'd put on that yellow dress straight away rather than hang it up in her room. Her eyes swept over Jessie, taking in his muscular frame and handsome, strong face. He's just perfect, Annie thought. He stood next to her and patted Stanley. I'm coming for dinner tonight, he told her. Annie faced Jessie while still scratching Stanley's ears. Oh, good. I didn't know, she replied. Yeah, and I was hoping you'd make me a pumpkin pie for dessert. Jessie stopped patting Stanley and leaned against the stable door and looked down at Annie. Annie laughed to cover her nervousness and the pitter-patter of her racing heart. If Mom hasn't already got something for dessert, then I will cook you a pumpkin pie, she said. Jessie smiled at her and she felt heat rise to her cheeks. She hoped he'd think that her rosy cheeks were from the biting wind that was weaving its way through the open barn door. I finally got some sort of sign that he likes me. Jessie asking me to cook something special for him is definitely a good sign, Annie thought. He could have asked Sarah, who's always busy in the kitchen, or Mom, but he asked me. Annie's feelings were making her uncomfortable. These were feelings she wasn't used to. She changed the subject to avoid appearing awkward. How is your horse trading going? It's going good, thank you. Jessie was silent for a moment. It would probably do better if I didn't have the farm as well, he replied. Jessie looked down and kicked a small pebble. It gets difficult to divide my time between the two. The income from the horse trading helps a lot since the income from the farm hasn't really been good these past few years, he told her. Annie was aware that things had been hard on the farm for Jessie and his brother Benjamin. She was pleased that he was doing something to bring him some extra money, and something that he enjoyed doing as well. Six months ago, Jessie had gone into business buying horses that were too slow for the racetrack and selling them to the Amish, as they made fine buggy horses. Jessie continued speaking. I've had to get a computer, to help me with the horse business. It's saving me a lot of time. Annie was unable to hide the shocked look on her face. What? Wires coming into the house? They're a link to the outside world, she exclaimed. Jessie hastened to reassure her. I keep it out in the barn, though, with the phone. I've sort of made myself a little office out in the barn. Annie nodded. Sounds like you're very organized. 
Yeah, I have to be really organized because I've got so much to do. Why is he telling me this? Annie wondered. Is he trying to tell me that he doesn't have any time for me? Surely not. He's never even showed me he likes me at all. Except for just now when he asked me to cook pumpkin pie for him. Or does he think I like him, and he's trying to let me know he has no time for a wife? What about Liz? Does he even know that Liz likes him? If he did know that Liz liked him, would he be asking me to cook for him? Annie realized that she was not being very conversational, but she was only being quiet because she was rather confused by all the things that he was saying to her. He's so hard to work out. I wonder if all men are so difficult to understand. Jessie looked at Annie for a while before speaking. Well, I best be going. I just came around to drop some things off to your dad. I've got a lot of work to do before dinner. Annie tried to cover up the confusion by smiling broadly. Have a good day then, she replied. I will, and you as well. Jessie walked to the door and called over his shoulder. Now don't forget pumpkin pie, please, and try and make it exactly like your mom makes it. Annie laughed at his playfulness. Yeah, I will see what I can do, but I can't make any promises, she called after him. Annie watched Jessie's handsome, strong silhouette walk out toward the sunlight through the barn door. Jessie brightened Annie's heart every time she saw him. When he was out of sight, she turned her attention back to Stanley. Did you see him, Stanley? That man who was just here? He's the love of my life, apart from you, of course. Annie smoothed Stanley up and down the side of his neck. No one will ever take your place. She gave Stanley another scratch behind his ear. Now I have to impress him with a pie. Chapter 4 Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, 4 The house is so quiet now with Kate gone and Liz is leaving soon too. Then you two will get married and I'll be left here all alone. Annie's mother sat down in a chair at the dining room table. Annie was a little pleased to hear her mother sharing her feelings. Her mother was usually a no-nonsense sort of person. Annie knew that her parents loved all their children, but they were not people who spoke openly of affection. We'll be here for a while and besides, you'll always have dad. Annie's mom nodded. Yeah, but it won't be the same with all you girls gone. Annie stood up and patted her mom on the shoulder. I'll make you some hot lemon tea. Thank you, that would be nice, her mother replied. It was a rare moment as the two girls and their mother sat at the table and drank hot lemon tea. There was always so much work to do that the only time they usually sat down together was at mealtimes. Liz spent most days looking for work, and when she was home she often helped with the chores or read books in her room. You girls are so good to me, Annie's mom said. Mom, you always tell me not to worry about the future, Sarah said before continuing. It's now that matters. If you want to talk about the future, then think good things about the future. Like that it might not be long before Kate has a baby. She can bring him or her over for you to look after when she goes to work. Mom visibly brightened as delight showed on her face. That would be wonderful. I hope she wants me to look after the baby, she replied. Annie looked over at Sarah and smiled at how excited their mother was at just the mention of a baby. She was always so serious and seemed so tired all the time. But at the mention of a baby, she'd brightened right up. Sarah said, Don't get too excited just yet, Mom. She's not even expecting. You may have a long wait. Besides, she may give up work and stay home and look after the baby herself. Annie wished Sarah hadn't said those words as their mother's spirits were dampened once more. Annie shot Sarah a glaring look. Sarah shrugged her shoulders by way of an apology. Oh, thank you for the tea, Annie. Yeah, thank you, Annie, Sarah said. I'm not glad to be still at home, Annie thought. I'd much rather be Jessie's wife and living with him. I should have gotten married first being the older sister, but Kate got married before me. Now my only interest is in Jessie and he doesn't seem to notice me at all. Well, maybe he does like me since he asked me to cook for him, but Liz is the one he's always looking at. Annie's mother rose from the table after swallowing the last mouthful of tea. Well, come on, you two. We've got dinner to prepare, and don't forget to make extra because Jessie's coming. Annie smiled at the suggestion to make extra for Jessie as they always had a mountain of food left over anyway. Annie excused herself and went upstairs to change into the yellow dress Liz gave her. If the new dress doesn't work, I've always got the pumpkin pie, Annie thought. If I can't compete for his attention with looks, then maybe I can reach him through his stomach. 
Yeah, that's it. I can show him what a good wife I'll make through my cooking. The only trouble was that Annie considered herself not a very capable cook, and she knew she'd have to learn fast. Annie went into the kitchen and put an apron over her new lemon-colored dress. Can I make the dessert, Mom? A slightly shocked expression covered her mother's face, and she tried to cover it up so she wouldn't hurt her daughter's feelings. Yeah, as long as we have the ingredients here. What would you like to make? Pumpkin pie, Jessie's favorite. The smiles on Sarah's face and also her mother's face didn't escape Annie's notice. Yeah, we have everything we need for that, Sarah said. All right, you two, stop smiling. You may have to help me with it a little. I really want to impress Jessie, Annie said. Annie's mother nodded. Is that why you have a new dress on? Annie smiled and nodded. We'll help you with the cooking. He's a good man, her mom said. Annie had never made her feelings for Jessie a secret from her family. Annie's family had always been very close to Jesse and his brother, Benjamin, even before their parents had died in the buggy accident. Both Jesse's family and Annie's family were the fourth generations on the farms they occupied, so naturally the families had become very close. Sarah flipped through the card system where the family recipes were kept. Many of their recipes were closely guarded secrets and had been that way for as long as they could remember, maybe even since the family first arrived in Lancaster County from the old country. Sarah plucked a well-worn card out of the box. Ah, here it is, pumpkin pie. Annie felt a warm glow within herself. At last, she was able to do something that may capture Jesse's attention, and hopefully along with it, his heart. Annie, are you listening? Annie looked up at her sister. Yeah, of course. What ingredients do I need to fetch? It's right there on the top of part of the card, see? Sarah impatiently pointed to the words. Flour, golden syrup, sugar, some eggs, and there's some pumpkin over there that you can start cutting up. Okay. And then I boil it, right? Annie asked. Sarah looked a little frustrated and raised her voice a tad. Just fetch the ingredients first so you have everything in front of you, she said. Yeah, all right. Then I boil the pumpkin after I cut it? Don't be mean to me, Sarah. I haven't done this before. I'm sorry I don't mean to be rude, but it's rather obvious. Look at this. Sarah passed Annie the recipe card. Just do everything it says, and if you get stuck, just let me know. Sarah hurried away. Annie glanced over the recipe card, thankful that she had Sarah there to guide her through the whole daunting process. Well, Annie didn't quite know where Sarah had disappeared to, but she was sure she would be able to find her if she got stuck and needed direction. Even though Annie had never bothered much with cooking, she was sure that she would be able to do it if she had to. Besides that, it didn't look that hard if all she had to do was follow the instructions on the little recipe card. It couldn't be as hard as breaking in a horse or training it under harness. That was what Annie wanted to be good at, in fact, anything to do with animals. Sure, she helped out with the cooking from time to time, but she'd always left the majority of the cooking and the sewing to her younger, more capable sisters, Kate and Sarah. Annie considered that due to her age, she should learn to cook a lot better, so she could keep her husband happy when she got married. Why do cooking and sewing have to be women's work only, Annie thought. It had always annoyed her that her dad had never taught her the woodworking that had occupied so much of his time. He'd said that it was men's work and had refused to teach her one little thing about it, preferring instead to try and teach her reluctant younger brother Jacob. Jacob couldn't care a toss about making furniture, but he did love to learn about horses, and he loved to help with the heavy farm work. One thing Annie was grateful for was that her dad had always let her tend the horses, even though he should have seen that as men's work too. While the pumpkin was boiling on the little wood stove, Annie looked back at the recipe card. Hmm. Now for the pie crust. She was determined to do it herself as much as she could without any help whatsoever. Annie plunged her hands into the flour, sugar, and the butter, and mixed the ingredients together. She recalled her mother telling her many years ago, just to use fingertips, not your whole hands. A couple of hours later, Annie was convinced that the pie was looking good. Annie looked up as Sarah walked in the kitchen. Sarah, where have you been? I went for a walk, Sarah replied. Annie noticed that her sister's face looked very flushed, as if she'd been running. She also appeared to be slightly out of breath. Just a walk? Yeah. Why do you look so guilty? It occurred to Annie that Sarah had been doing quite a bit of disappearing lately. Because, dear sister, I am guilty, 
guilty of leaving you alone in the kitchen with the pumpkin pie. Sarah whipped her sister lightly with the cloth they used for wiping the dishes dry. Annie laughed. I think I've done all right. Have a look at it. Sarah opened the oven door just a little bit and studied the pie. It looks good. It looks quite good, actually. Annie said, I hope it tastes all right. I can honestly say that I've made this pumpkin pie all by myself. I hope that impresses him. If he can see that I can cook just as good as my mom, he may start to see me as a good choice for a wife. Liz may look good, but looks don't last. Annie was thinking of any and every reason she should have the sole attention of her heart's desire, Jesse. Chapter 5 In the midst of Liz's constant chatter over dinner, it was a wonder that anyone else could get a word in. Jesse and Annie did manage to have a brief discussion about horses. Liz interrupted their conversation. It must be so exciting. I've never been to the racetrack. You could come along sometime then. Jesse picked up a forkful of fried potato and placed it carefully into his mouth. I'd love to. Thank you, Liz said. Annie looked up quickly and her mouth fell open in shock at Liz and Jesse flirting with each other right there at the table in front of everyone. She tried to hide her involuntary reaction, grateful that no one seemed to notice. That confirms it then. He loves her, Annie thought as she pushed the food around on her plate with a fork. It couldn't be clearer. The Meadows racetrack was 25 miles away. The horses raced were standard breads, a breed developed especially for harness racing some 200 years ago. The buggies they pulled were small racing buggies, which consisted of two large wheels and a seat for the driver. Annie had heard a lot about the horse races, but had never actually been to one. The closest she had gotten were the horse auctions that she frequently attended with her dad. Annie would have loved to go to the racetrack with Jesse, but that was obviously not to be. She couldn't declare her interest in going to the track now, not after he'd just invited Liz. I wonder if he would have invited me if I were wearing a clinging, knit, soft, lilac-colored dress like Liz is wearing, Annie thought. As if sensing some sort of disapproval from Annie's dad, Jesse turned to him and said, I only go there once a week so my farming is not suffering. I still get everything done so I don't overburden Benjamin with everything. Yeah, I know. I'm proud of you doing so well, Annie's dad said. A little smile tugged at the corners of Jesse's mouth. Annie could see how much her dad's approval meant to him, which reminded Annie just how much Jesse must have missed his own parents. Annie rose to her feet and started clearing the empty dishes from the table. I've made something special for dessert. Pumpkin pie? Jesse gave Annie a huge grin. Why is he smiling at me like that when he's just asked another girl out in front of my face? Annie wondered. Annie smiled back just as broadly as if nothing were bothering her. Yeah, as ordered. She tried to sound disinterested. Thank you, Annie, he said. If he hadn't just asked Liz on a date in front of everybody at the table, Annie would have been pleased that at last she was getting some attention from Jesse. As she placed the pumpkin pie on the table, Annie no longer cared how it tasted. In fact, she hoped it tasted rather horrid. Annie cut the large pie and gave a slice to each person. She sat down and bit on the end of a fingernail anxiously, waiting for their response. Annie's dad was the first to speak. This pie is wonderful, Annie nearly as good as your mother's pies. Thank you, Dad. Annie smiled at the rare praise her father had given her, and then she caught a glimpse of him shooting a loving look over to her mother. Annie hoped that one day, she would have an enduring love like theirs. They were so suited to each other, and they balanced each other perfectly, like two halves of a whole. Her father was very strict and lived by the old Amish ways. However, Annie's mother always managed to have him respect and listen to her thoughts, even if they were opposed to his, as sometimes they were. Jesse spoke as soon as he'd finished his first mouthful. Yeah, it certainly is. You've done a good job, Annie, he told her. Annie nodded her head slightly in acknowledgement of Jesse's comment, yet she did not look at him. She could not look at him. All she could do was push the pie around on the plate with her fork and hope that dinner would end quickly. How could he be so uncaring of my feelings that he would ask another girl out in front of me? Surely he knows of my feelings toward him. He didn't just ask her out in front of me, but in front of my whole family. She was at least thankful that everyone was concentrating on eating their pie, and no one had noticed that she was not eating hers. 
Annie lifted her gaze from her plate and immediately wished she had not, as she noticed that Jessie was staring straight at Liz again. Oh my, how can I compete with Liz? I've cooked for him, but still, I can never look as beautiful as she does, she thought. Not in these clothes. How can an Amish woman compete with an English woman when they have so many ways in which they can hide their flaws? For the first time in her life, Annie felt totally helpless. Liz had told her that she had fallen in love with an Amish man, and although she wouldn't say who it was, it was without a doubt Jesse. Annie stared at Jesse and knew in her heart, the way he looked at Liz, that Jesse was also smitten as well. Chapter 6 Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Psalm 31, 24 Annie woke up to the sunlight streaming through her window. Her mom had let her sleep rather than make an early start on the chores since she was going to the horse auction. Annie's father had asked her to purchase another carriage horse. Up until now, they had only needed one carriage horse because Annie's dad often had Benjamin or Jesse run errands. With Benjamin and Jesse becoming so busy, Annie's father decided it best to not depend on them so heavily, and that meant getting another carriage horse. Of course, Annie had encouraged him the best she could toward that decision. Under normal circumstances, Annie would have asked Jesse's advice on horses, and he would have offered to accompany her to the auction, but these weren't normal circumstances. Jesse was obviously in love with Liz, and now she had returned his interest. Annie just had to get him out of her mind. Spending time with Jesse would only increase her heartache, and besides, she didn't want the embarrassment of Jesse thinking that she liked him. Annie considered that getting a new horse was a marvelous way for her to take her mind off Jesse. She was delighted to be getting a new horse, and also delighted to be able to choose one entirely by herself. Finally, her dad was seeing that he could give her some responsibility to do something which he'd always referred to as men's work, something other than cooking and cleaning. Sure, he'd let her look after the horses, but this was the first time he'd given her any responsibility other than that. The horse auction was a place Annie had often frequented, not just to see all the horses, but to socialize as well. Annie had no friends outside the Amish community, but the auction was one place where the Amish mixed with the Mennonites and the English. What made things difficult for Annie, she considered, was that her dad had given her no instructions on what to look for in a horse. He had left it all up to her. The responsibility weighed heavily on her shoulders. She knew that if she got it wrong, then that would shut the door on any future opportunities that her dad might see fit to give her. He'd given her a budget of $2,000, and then whispered to her that she could go to $3,000, if she saw something special. She decided that she wanted a handsome-looking gelding, not too young, not too old, with no major confirmation faults. Before the auction began, Annie walked through the barn where the horses to be auctioned were tied to posts. She wanted to have a close look at the horses so she would know which ones to bid on. She supposed that many people would find the smell of the horses and the horse manure offensive, but she found it pleasing, like sweet perfume. She giggled aloud. It hardly compared to Liz's perfume. There were so many different types of horses from standard breads, thoroughbreds and draft horses, of all ages and types. Throngs of people were studying the horses, opening their mouths and studying their hooves, while the officials were doing their best to limit the physical contact between man and beast prior to purchase. The air was buzzing with a dull throng of a myriad conversations mixed with the occasional shout. Annie went through the rows of horses, but there were so many that she was getting confused. How was she possibly going to choose just one horse out of all these? Finally, 15 minutes before the action was due to start, she decided to head back to her seat. Her head hung low. Annie sent up a silent prayer. God, help me choose a good horse, please. And with that prayer, Annie decided to have one more quick look up and down between the countless rows of horses. A bay standard bred horse caught her eye. He had a white star on his forehead and a blaze, which was very narrow down his nose and continued down to one side of his nostrils only. Annie reached forward to steady the notes on him that were waving in the breeze. The information on him was that he was a three-year-old gelding already trained to harness. An ideal age, Annie thought. She patted his nose and he stretched out his neck for more, so Annie stepped forward and scratched him on the side of the neck. Focus, Annie, focus. Don't let emotions get involved. You need to find the best horse for the job, not a pet, Annie silently scolded herself. 
Normally Annie would have loved to be around so many horses, but this sea of horses and the bustling crowd along with the weight of responsibility made her task less enjoyable. How she wished that her father had come with her. Finally, Annie decided on three horses she liked and noted down the numbers. More than likely it would come down to price and also which horse would be auctioned first. Annie squeezed her way back through the lively crowd to find Sarah so that they could take a seat before the auction started. Annie and her younger sister Sarah took a seat on one of the benches in the large crowd. The air was thick with excitement. Annie couldn't help herself from continually searching the crowd in the hopes that Jesse might be at the same auction. As yet, she hadn't seen any sign of him. There were many Amish men with their standard dress, the bard with no mustache, the straw hats, and black pants with suspenders. If Jesse is here, it would be almost impossible to see him amongst all these people. Annie continued her search nevertheless. Annie's gaze turned to the Mennonite men who showed their differences in their clothing, which were black hats instead of straw hats. They did wear the suspended pants in the same way as the Amish, however. There were so many Englishers, too, and as always their clothing varied to a large degree. Mostly they wore faded old jeans, but some, Annie noted, were dressed a little less casually. Sarah, I'll save us these seats, and would you go get me a soda and a hot dog, please? Annie always enjoyed the chance to have some different type of food other than her usual fare of home cooking, and always enjoyed a hot dog when she came to the auctions. No sooner had Sarah left to get the food than Annie was tapped on the shoulder. She smiled widely and swiveled in her seat, thinking it was Jessie. However, her smile lessened when she looked around and saw that it was in fact Ephraim Zook, the Ephraim who had been a potential suitor of her sister Kate. He was handsome, she thought, but nowhere near as handsome as Jesse. Hello, Ephraim. Good morning, Annie. Are you buying a horse? He asked. At that point, Annie noticed there was a man standing behind Ephraim. Seeing her looking at the young man, Ephraim pulled him forward. Have you met my cousin, John? He asked. I think so. Hello, John. Annie wasn't sure if she'd met him or not, but thought it most polite to say that she thought she'd met him. Hello, John said. Oh, sorry. John, this is Annie, one of Isaac and Elizabeth Miller's daughters, Ephraim said. John nodded his head in recognition of her parents' names. Hello again. Annie answered Ephraim's previous question. Am I buying a horse? I aim to be, but so far I haven't had much luck choosing one. I've just been walking through having a look at them. Annie shook her head in frustration. What type of horse are you looking for? John asked. Annie thought that John looked an agreeable young man, and he had a nice manner about him. He was quite pleasing to the eyes, just as Ephraim was. Dad sent me to look for a new carriage horse. Ephraim nodded. Ah, come with me. He gestured for her to follow him. Annie looked around to see if she could see Sarah. She didn't want to lose their seats and Sarah wouldn't know where she'd gone. The most important thing is to get a good horse. I can always find Sarah later, Annie thought. Ephraim turned around. Come on. It's just that I'm holding these seats waiting for Sarah to come back. She won't be long. Can't wait, Ephraim turned to John, his cousin. You stay here and wait for Sarah. John smiled and gave a quick nod of his head in agreement. Annie thought that Sarah would be most pleased to have John waiting there for her, a nice-looking young Amish man, rather than herself. The decision had been made. Annie turned back to face Ephraim and noticed that he was already striding off in the direction of the horses for sale, so she scurried off to catch up with him. His confidence gave Annie new hope, and she followed close behind him, weaving through the crowds. Chapter 7 The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Nahum 1, 3 Here, what about this one? Ephraim stood in front of a very large bay horse, it was the very same one who had put his nose out for Annie to scratch earlier. Annie was pleased that her attraction to this horse might not have been entirely emotional after all. We've met before. I was immediately drawn to him, but there are so many to choose from it just gets confusing. Looks to be about three or four, I'd guess. Ephraim smoothed a hand right across his body and paid particular attention to his legs. I've looked at his paperwork. He is three. Annie was pleased that Ephraim had chosen the very horse that she liked. He must know about horses, she thought. He even guessed the age right. Thank you so much for your help, Ephraim. You're welcome, 
Let's have a quick look at the others. Ephraim produced a notepad from his pocket and wrote down the auction numbers of the three horses he liked the best. Two of them were ones that Annie had already picked. After looking over almost the entire lot, Ephraim ripped the little piece of notepaper from his pad. Here you are. Thank you. You've been such a help. I must get back to Sarah now. She'll be wondering where I've got to. Annie hurried away from Ephraim. She wasn't one to listen to rumors, but she had heard some gossip about him being a bit fast with the ladies. She did not wish to give him the wrong impression by lingering with him or talking to him for too long. Thankfully, Annie found Sarah at exactly the place she'd left, sitting on the same bench and engaged in a conversation with John. Annie at once thought that they looked good together and that John seemed to be enjoying Sarah's company. Sarah looked up and saw Annie. John followed Sarah's gaze to Annie. Well, did you find one? He asked. Yeah, I've got three that would be suitable. Ephraim was a good help. I'll leave you two ladies here then. John rose from the bench where he was sitting next to Sarah. Thank you, John, Annie said. You're welcome. John strode away as the two girls watched him. Well, he seems nice, and from the look on your face, you seem to think he's nice as well, Annie said as she looked to see if Sarah had her hot dog. Yeah, was all Sarah said, and then she handed Annie a half-eaten hot dog. Sorry, I got hungry. Annie took the half-eaten hot dog from her sister's outstretched hand. You should have got yourself one. I did, and I ate that too, Sarah laughed. Half a hot dog is better than none, Annie thought. A Mennonite man was running the auction, and Annie could barely understand the figures he was barking out over the noise of the crowd. Her confidence immediately faltered. Had she taken on more than she was able? No, I have to do this. I need to show Dad that I can take more responsibility. She looked down at the numbers Ephraim had scribbled and saw that her favorite horse, the Big Bay, was near the end of the auction. Should she wait to bid on him? What if she waited and he went for higher than her limit of $3,000? That would mean she'd have to go home empty-handed. Not that it would matter too much, she figured. Auctions were on all the time, so she'd just go to the next one. Yet she did want to buy a horse today. Annie had never realized just how stressful auctions could be. Annie bit her lip hard as two of the three horses on her list went through the auction and were sold. One had sold for $3,500, and the other for $3,100, and they were nowhere near as handsome as the bay horse she'd set her heart on. She squeezed the auction paddle hard, hoping she'd made the right decision to wait for her favorite horse to be auctioned, rather than bid on the earlier ones. A nervous hour later, the horse that she wanted was led into the auction ring. Annie stood up and positioned herself where she could be seen clearly by the auctioneer. What happened next, Annie wasn't sure. It all happened so quickly while adrenaline was coursing through her veins. She knew she had lifted that paddle up three times. Then she heard the auctioneer say, Sold to number 32. Annie looked at her paddle to confirm it. Yes, she was number 32 and she had gotten her horse and paid $2,000. Her dad would be proud. She couldn't understand why he had sold for less money than the other horses. He was nearly the last horse to be sold, so perhaps that had something to do with it, being that everyone else had spent their money and bought what they had come to buy. Annie excitedly gathered up Sarah and they made their way to the office to settle up the money and to find someone to truck the handsome bay horse home to the farm. Jessie found Annie crouched down, scrubbing the porch. Did I hear right? You bought a horse? Annie looked up to the sound of Jessie's voice, squinting because the sun was in her eyes. She was sure he was shaking his head. Yeah, I'm quite capable of doing things like that. Besides, Ephraim was there and he helped me choose. Annie rose to her feet. Ephraim! Jessie's face fumed beet red and Annie thought he might explode. You asked Ephraim to go with you and not me? Annie felt heat rise to her cheeks. No, it wasn't like that. I just happened to see Ephraim there and he offered his opinion. Jesse was obviously annoyed and put his hands on his hips. Why didn't you ask me to accompany you to the auction? I buy horses all the time. I know more about horses than Ephraim. His comment surprised Annie. Was he jealous of Ephraim, she wondered? No, why would he be? It's Liz he's interested in, not me. At that moment, Annie realized she had missed a good opportunity to spend time with Jesse. Maybe if he had spent a whole day with me while we chose a horse together, he would have seen how well we get on together and realized that there's more to someone than just their looks. I'm so stupid. 
Sorry, Jesse, I just didn't think. Jesse seemed to calm down as his shoulders lowered slightly. Did you buy a carriage horse or a draft horse? Dad thought we should have an extra carriage horse. Jesse put his hand to his forehead and looked most frustrated. Annie, I have two on my books right now that would have been absolutely perfect. Already trained under harness, quiet and sound. Annie stood up, alarmed that he was so upset. I'm sorry, Jesse, I should have bought one from you. Annie was a little ashamed of herself that she'd let her feelings for him come before their friendship by not considering buying one of his horses. Jesse shrugged his shoulders and this time spoke a little more quietly. I just want to help you, that's all. What did he mean by that, Annie thought. She studied his face and she could tell that he was still quite upset with her even after her apology. Did he mean he just wanted to help me as a neighbor and for me not to think there was any other reason that he would want to help me? Yeah. He doesn't want me to think that he likes me. He just wants to help me and that's all. Come and see him. He's a fine looking bay, she said aloud. Yeah, I'd like to see him, he replied. Chapter 8 I know this horse. I had the chance to buy him before he went to auction and I can tell you he's a little flighty. That's why I didn't touch him. Jesse patted him firmly on the shoulders. He's a fine looking horse though, he added. Annie looked up into Jesse's hazel eyes. Oh no, what will I do? She asked. He should get better over time with age. There's really no way to tell if he'll get quieter or not, but he most likely will, he told her. When do you think I should start training him? Annie asked. Annie knew that Jesse was excellent at training horses, so was keen to listen to his advice. You could start now, but just slowly. Buggies are heavier than racing carts, so his muscles and joints need build up to take the load. If he's thrown into heavy work too soon, it could do all sorts of damage, he replied. Annie nodded, as if she was taking all his words in. Of course, she knew all that he was telling her, but her mother had advised her that it doesn't hurt to appear helpless around a man to make them feel good. Jesse turned away from the horse and faced Annie. Are you going to the volleyball game this evening, Annie? he asked. Yeah, will I see you there? Jesse nodded his head. Annie didn't always go to the volleyball game, but Sarah had asked Annie to go with her in the hopes of seeing John there. Sarah was quite taken with John and had scarcely talked of anything else since the horse auction. There was to be a volleyball tournament sponsored by the Lions Club, where money was being raised to feed the poor. There would also be other nets set up for people who just wanted to play to socialize and just to have fun. Annie was pleased that Sarah had found a man she was fond of, and she hoped, for her sake, that John would be there. This was the first man she'd ever made mention of, so their brief meeting must have made a really good impression on her. Jesse cleared his throat. Would you like me to take you to the volleyball game? He asked. Yeah, that would be nice, thank you. Sarah is coming as well, she replied. Jesse nodded, and Annie thought his face dropped a little at the mention of Sarah going to the game, too. Could he have wanted to be alone with me? Or was he disappointed that Liz wasn't coming as well? Maybe he asked me because he thought that I might bring Liz. Jesse didn't stay long after their discussion about volleyball. I best get going. I will see you this evening then, he told her. Their brief time together that morning had made Annie very happy indeed, and she was looking forward to the evening. She definitely felt a little something between them, like a little sizzle in the air, and decided to ignore the fact that he was attracted to Liz. They haven't made anything public yet, and besides, Liz would have to return to the community, and I don't think she'll do that. I still have a chance with Jesse. Annie knew it wasn't a situation she wanted to be in. She didn't want to have to compete with someone else for a man, but what else was she to do? He's here, Sarah whispered to Annie when they arrived at the volleyball game. Good. I'm glad. Annie glanced in the direction Sarah kept looking in and saw John waving at them. As it turned out, John was playing in the tournament. Everyone watched the tournament before they played their own games, which were just for fun. Sarah's eyes were fixed on John the whole time. Annie noticed that once or twice John's eyes gravitated to Sarah. After the tournament was finished, Annie felt a tap on the shoulder. She swung around to see Ephraim. How's the horse? he asked. Oh, Ephraim, the horse is good. Thank you again for helping me. Strange how that's the second time he's approached me from behind, she thought. First at the auction and now here, almost like he's been following me. She dismissed those silly thoughts. 
Of course, he couldn't be following her. She'd come directly from home in Jesse's buggy. Out of nowhere, Jesse appeared and stepped in between them. Hello, Ephraim. I haven't seen you for some time. Before Ephraim could respond, Jesse continued. Thank you for helping Annie at the auction. Annie felt that Jesse's words were almost showing ownership of her by thanking him on her behalf. Annie thought that Jesse's words were like saying, she's mine. Or maybe she just liked him so much that she was reading too much into his words. Anytime you need some advice on horses, Jesse, I'd be glad to help, Ephraim said, obviously taunting Jesse. I won't be needing any of your advice on horses, thank you, Ephraim. I wasn't able to be there to help Annie, that's all. Annie considered that Jesse's response was a little hot-headed, even though he was being provoked. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. Ephraim nodded his head at the two of them, then left. Annie looked at Jesse, who smiled at her and appeared a little guilty. Annie knew he'd overstepped his boundaries, but she felt that he certainly didn't like the attention she was getting from another man. He was trying to give Ephraim the impression that they were a couple, like they were courting, and it had worked. Jesse was definitely jealous, Annie thought. Annie had seen signs of jealousy from Jesse over Ephraim ever since Ephraim had helped her choose the horse at the auction. Could he like both me and Liz, she wondered. Surely not, we are both so different. Chapter 9 For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Romans 8, 24, 25. It was late in the afternoon, and the brisk late October air was biting against Annie's hands as she and Sarah were taking the dry clothes off the line. Annie, can I tell you a secret? Annie unpinned the last shirt and placed it in the wicker basket. Yeah, of course you can. Sarah was almost standing to attention and looked very nervous. You can't tell anyone, okay? Annie picked up the basket of clothes. Yeah, what is it? I've been running around with John. Annie placed the basket down on the grass and looked at Sarah. Sarah was her younger sister, and Annie felt she'd failed in looking out for her, if she was only just finding this out now. John? John from the auction and the volleyball? The only John whom Annie knew who was roughly Sarah's age was John, Ephraim's cousin, whom they had only just met. Sarah's eyes twinkled and her hands clasped in front of her heart. Yeah. Like I said, I met him a couple of months ago at the youth group. Annie could scarcely believe what she was saying. How long has it been going on then? About two months now, since we met each other that very first day. Wait, Sarah, I'm confused. You already knew him before the horse auction? Annie asked. Sarah nodded. Yeah, I met him at youth group two months ago. Annie didn't know what to say. She thought back over the past few months of all the times that Sarah had gone missing, and no one knew where she was. Sarah had never been a secretive sort of person before. It wasn't unusual for Amish couples to date in private before they announced their betrothal, but Annie was sure that she would have always known what her sisters were doing. Annie realized that Sarah was staring at her in the hopes of some sign of delight. Annie had mixed feelings and wasn't sure how to react. However, she didn't want to spoil the moment for Sarah since she seemed so happy. Annie decided to be supportive, despite her fearful thoughts. Oh, Sarah, I'm happy for you. He seems like a really nice man. Sarah was nearly jumping up and down. He is. He really is. Let's get in out of the cold. It's freezing out here, Annie said as she picked up the basket of clothes and they both made their way inside the warm house. Annie was a little concerned about Sarah seeing John because she didn't know him at all and didn't know his family either. She knew his cousin Ephraim, but that in itself was certainly not a good recommendation. Ephraim always seemed to be surrounded by rumors and gossip. Sarah rubbed her hands together and held them out over the stove to keep them warm. I'll make a pot of coffee to warm us up. Yeah, good idea. Annie took the opportunity to sit down and have a break from her chores. In the kitchen, their mother was making the bread that accompanied every meal, so Annie and Sarah positioned themselves at the furthest end of the large dining table in the hope that they would not be overheard. Annie knew her sister well and figured that Sarah had a little more to tell her. The girls warmed their hands around the steaming mugs of coffee. Sarah spoke in a very quiet voice. I need to talk to you about something, something that I've been thinking of for a while. Sarah's tone was most serious. 
Annie's was worried and her full attention was on what Sarah was going to say next. Yeah, what is it? She took a mouthful of coffee and leaned in a little closer. Sarah took a deep breath, closed her eyes, and almost blurted out, I'm thinking of leaving. Annie nearly spat her coffee out all over the table, but managed to swallow it even though it was far too hot. The community? she asked. Sarah opened her eyes and looked at Annie. Yeah. Annie put her hand to her mouth and tried to hide the surprise in her voice. Why? Annie, there's a whole big world out there and I've seen nothing of it. Annie glanced over her shoulder at her mother to be sure she couldn't hear them. She had her back turned to them and was humming a hymn to herself, so Annie considered they were fairly safe. Sarah continued, We just know what is in this tiny space. We have to live by these rules and regulations, but who says the rules are right? Of course the rules are right. Annie had finally seen Sarah grow up into a lovely young woman who would make someone an excellent wife, and now she was thinking of leaving the community of leaving her family. Are you doubting your faith? Annie's thoughts turned selfishly to herself. She had seen how upset her parents were when Kate left the community for four years. Could she go through that again? Well, not my faith, exactly. Just doubting having to do things a certain way, Sarah said as she took another sip of her coffee. Annie's eyes followed her as she put the mug to her mouth. Aren't you happy here, Sarah? Sarah nodded her head. Yeah, but I want to get my GED and see what I can make of myself. What about Mom and Dad? You know what it did to them when Kate left. Annie knew that if Sarah left, then that would mean that all the house chores would fall on her shoulders. It would also mean less time that Annie would be able to spend looking after her horses, as she would have to spend most of her time inside, cooking and cleaning. That was something that Sarah loved to do, but not Annie. Annie realized that she was being quite selfish, and that Sarah should be able to make up her own mind to leave or to stay. Sarah shouldn't stay in the community if her heart was not in it. Sarah's eyes lifted up to the ceiling. That's the only thing that has kept me here and the only reason I haven't been on Rumspringa. Annie immediately felt a pain in her heart. The only reason she was staying in the Amish community was her family, the farm, not the faith. Annie was a little scared by her words. Sarah moved her head a little closer to Annie and spoke even more softly. Don't you ever think of what life could be like away from here? Sarah asked. No, I don't. I couldn't imagine being away from my family or away from my horses. Of course, Annie was curious what lay outside of the Amish community, but she didn't want to leave it. She hadn't even wanted to go on Rumspringa even though Kate had done it. Sarah seemed frustrated and let out a huge sigh. Don't you ever wonder what it's like to use a computer, cell phone, television, or to wear pretty clothes? Annie said, you remember what the bishop said about television, don't you? Yeah, that television is like devil's horns poking out of a chimney. Sarah shrugged her shoulders. No, I haven't really thought about those things. Annie was becoming aggravated by Sarah's lack of appreciation of the life she already had. She had good friends, family, and a farm. And sooner or later, her sister would be blessed with a baby and she'd be an aunt for the very first time. Look at what you've got, Sarah. You've got a family, good friends. God's been good to you. Why leave all this for some uncertain future without your family and where you know no one? Who would you have to support you? Sarah shrugged her shoulders once more. Annie, I want more. I want some sort of a job where I have to use my brain. I don't want to just cook and clean forever. I also want to wear pretty clothes. I want to paint my face so I look beautiful and I want to wear high-heeled shoes like the ladies in Liz's magazines. Sarah took a deep breath. I want to go to exciting places and meet exciting people. Sarah, all these things might seem good, but they could take you away from God. We are in the world, but not of the world, remember? That's why we must keep separate from worldly things. Annie knew, off by heart, the words she heard nearly every second Sunday at their meetings. Sarah was silent for a while. Yeah, I know you're right, but sometimes I just want to be far away from the community. I feel people watch me all the time waiting for me to do something wrong. I know that a lot of the ladies gossip. Annie could not help but laugh. She knew what she meant, as sometimes she'd felt like some of the ladies did nothing but gossip about her as well. Nothing and nobody is perfect, Sarah. If we were all perfect, then we wouldn't need God's forgiveness. Thank God for what you have and let him take care of the people who watch what other people do so they can gossip about them. Nothing good comes from gossip, so pay it no mind. 
They were both silent for a while. In Annie's heart, she knew John had something to do with all this. Does this have anything to do with John? Annie asked. No, no. This is something I've been thinking over for a while. It's been good to talk things over, thank you. You always make me feel better. Sarah looked over her shoulder to make sure their mother was still not listening to their hushed conversation. Annie simply said, Now finish your coffee and go finish those chores. Annie doubted her sister's words. As much as she did want to believe what she was saying, Annie was certain that Sarah's thoughts of leaving the community did have something to do with John. She wondered if he had been putting worldly thoughts into Sarah's mind. Chapter 10 For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11 The next day, Jesse was due to deliver hay to Annie's family just as he did every second week. Annie stayed close to the barn because she knew he would shortly be making his delivery. As soon as she heard him arrive, she walked out of the barn to meet him. She intended to tell him that she had rearranged the barn and the hay was to be put in a different place than usual. Hello, Jesse. Come and see what I've done with the barn, she said. Jesse looked up from unloading the bales. Hello to you, Annie. You're very chirpy for this hour of the morning. Jesse carried a bale of hay with him as he followed Annie into the barn. At that moment, they both heard Annie's dad yelling out. Jesse dropped the bale of hay and they both rushed to the door of the barn. Annie's dad ran to meet them, holding up a piece of paper in the air. He was breathless from running, but he managed to say, Sarah's gone. Fear struck Annie's heart as she remembered their conversation from the previous day. Where's she gone? I don't know. Your mom just found this note from her. Annie's father was having trouble breathing. He leaned against the wall of the barn. Annie took the note from his hands. Mom and Dad, I've gone away for a while. I'm not sure when I'll be back, but this is something I have to do. Don't worry about me. I will be all right. Sarah. A chill went through Annie's body as she recalled word for word what Annie had said about wanting to leave the community and what she'd said about John. She had said that they were running around. What if she'd run away with John? Annie was annoyed with herself. It was clear that John's intentions were not honorable at all. Sarah had said she wanted to leave, but Annie had never thought it would be like this. Why hadn't she taken what Sarah had said more seriously? Jesse spoke to Annie's dad. You stay here in case she comes back. I'll hitch the buggy and Annie and I will go and find her. Thank you. I'll go and comfort Elizabeth. Her father said as he made his way back to the house to his wife. Jesse turned to Annie. Quick, let's get the buggy hitched. While they were hitching the buggy, Annie realized she had to divulge her sister's secret, at least to Jesse. Sarah told me yesterday that she's been running around with John. It was clear that Jesse was shocked. Ephraim's cousin John, he asked. Annie nodded. I don't mean to upset you, Annie, but I don't think he's Amish. I think he was just visiting his cousins he said. Annie immediately felt that she was going to be sick. In fact, she probably would have been, but she had to go and find Sarah and bring her home. Do you think she's run away with him? She asked. It looks very likely, he replied. Jesse immediately took the reins. Looks like we'll be heading to Ephraim's house. It was clear that Jesse was quite worried, which worried Annie all the more. She'd heard the rumors surrounding Ephraim, but had no idea that his cousin was pretending to be Amish and mixing amongst them as if he were one of them. Annie didn't want Sarah's reputation to be tainted, and if they didn't find her soon, that's exactly what may happen. What good man would want her if she was tainted by another man? Ephraim Zook lived on the other side of the county some 40 minutes away. Annie was frustrated that time was getting away from them. She should have asked Sarah more questions about John. Had she become so consumed over her own happiness that she'd overlooked her sister's welfare? God, forgive me for being so selfish. Please look after Sarah and bring her back home safely to her family. A dark red-colored house appeared as they turned a corner in the narrow road. This is it? Annie asked. Yeah, I've been here once before. He's got a big family, lots of brothers and sisters, he said. Before the buggy reached the house, they saw Ephraim mending one of the house fences. All kinds of thoughts raced through Annie's head. What shall we say? What if she hasn't run away with John? We can't say that Sarah's run away. 
The gossip will run wild and her reputation will be muddied, she said. Jesse was silent and looked as though he was deep in thought. Annie reinforced her concerns. Jesse, we can't let anyone know. Yeah, that is so. Jesse thought for a while longer. Okay, this is what we'll do. He's already seen us, so we don't have any time. We will just have to see how the conversation flows and we won't mention she's run away. Yeah? He announced. Annie nodded her head enthusiastically. She couldn't think of any better plan at this short notice. Jesse pulled the buggy up right in front of the fence Ephraim was working on. He called out from the buggy, Good morning, Ephraim. Ephraim stopped and tipped his hat. Hello, fine day for a buggy ride. Annie nodded her hello. Yeah, it is, Jesse said. We were just out your way and thought we'd stop by and say hello. Ephraim eyed them both as if he didn't believe a word of it. So you're looking for John, he asked. Annie and Jesse looked at each other and Annie's heart froze. Jesse responded quickly. Yeah, do you know where he is? A wicked smirk crept onto Ephraim's face. He's heading back to Ohio right about now, he replied. Ohio? Jesse nodded his head and tried to appear as though it was nothing that mattered to him. Oh well, good morning to you. I just remembered we have something to do in town. Ephraim laughed. Very well. Jesse turned the buggy and left. She must be planning to go back to Ohio with him, he said. Annie's heart hurt, and she hoped she wasn't having some sort of anxiety attack. I only hope we're not too late. What will we do? Train station, is all that Jesse said as his eyes were steadily fixed upon the road. Annie replayed the conversation she had with Sarah the previous day to see if she might find a clue to where she might possibly have gone. She didn't come up with any clues whatsoever. Well, if she's not there, I've got no idea where she would be. What if she's not with John at all? Jesse said, I think she's with John all right. Ephraim knew something, that was clear. The movement of the buggy, which Annie was accustomed to, was suddenly starting to make her feel a little nauseous. Yeah, he seemed to, didn't he? Annie thought water might help her upset tummy. She took a mouthful of water from the store of bottles behind her seat and opened another bottle and handed it to Jesse. No, no water for me, thank you. The only option they have from here is the train station. They could take the train to the bus train, or they could take the train straight there. I'm not sure if there is a train straight to Ohio. Either way, we'll take the buggy back to my place and get a taxi to the train station and hope that she's still there, he said. The drive back to Jessie's place seemed to take forever. Annie remained quiet, scared for her younger sister's safety. It was clear now that Ephraim's cousin was a most unprincipled man to run away with a girl. Annie hoped that Ephraim would not tell anyone of Sarah's plight. She could only imagine how her mom would be crying floods of tears back at home, fearing for her youngest daughter who would run away. Her dad would be trying to comfort her as best he could while being quite fearful himself. The image of her distraught parents played on her mind and she just knew she couldn't return home without Sarah. Mom and Dad will panic if we go back without her. We have to find her, Annie said. Jesse didn't answer and appeared to be concentrating on the road in front of him. It wasn't until they arrived at his house that he spoke. I'll phone for a taxi, then I'll help you unhitch Stanley. There's no telling how long we'll be, so we best unharness him. Thankfully, Jesse had a phone in his barn. While Annie shut Stanley in the spare stable, she heard Jesse's voice outside the barn. Taxi's here, Annie. Once in the taxi, Jesse turned to face Annie. Let's pray for Sarah's safety. Yeah, good idea, she replied. Jesse closed his eyes. Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask that Sarah be safely protected and please bring her home to us. Also, please don't let her be strayed by the world and help her to know that she is better off with her family. Amen. Thank you, that was great. That was the first time that Annie had heard Jesse pray. She had been so worried about Sarah that she had not even thought to pray. That was something she was not pleased about. The fact that praying was on the forefront of Jesse's mind made Annie like and respect him all the more. Annie was momentarily distracted by the smell of stale cigarette smoke and the taxi driver who was filling her field of vision. He was a very large man with a big bald head and tattoos covered all of his arms and most of his neck. This was the first time that Annie had seen anyone with tattoos. She had heard about tattoos, but had never seen any with her own eyes. He was smoking one cigarette after another, which accounted for the uncomfortable odor in the taxi. Annie was sure she would be quite fearful of the taxi driver had Jesse not been with her. 
the train station finally came into view, and Annie's heart raced as fearful thoughts again filled her head. As the taxi pulled into the taxi zone, Jesse asked the driver, Wait here for us, please. Hey, buddy, I'd be glad to, but what if you don't come back? There's already over 50 bucks on the meter. The man's tone was aggressive and rude. Here, will this do? Jesse threw $60 into the taxi. Once he saw that the money had satisfied the driver, he guided Annie by her elbow to hurry her into the train station. The station was huge, and there was no sign of Sarah anywhere. Jesse read the timetable on that large screen overhead. The next train leaves in half an hour. That means she wouldn't have had time to catch the last one. I'm pretty sure there are usually about three, maybe four trains a day, he said. Annie took a deep breath and hoped he was right. She was bitterly disappointed that there was absolutely no sign of Sarah or John. A horrible thought came into Annie's mind. What if Ephraim was trying to put us off their track? Or worse, what if Sarah is not with John and she could be anywhere? Who knows where she might be? Who knows what could become of her? Annie sat down and tears flowed down her cheeks. Jesse sat next to her. Don't give up, Annie. We'll find her. We have to. We prayed, remember? Now we have to trust in God. If it is his will, then we will find her. Annie nodded. She wanted to trust in God, but she couldn't stop crying. Annie looked up and saw that people were staring at them, obviously not used to seeing Amish people this far from the countryside. At this point, Annie didn't care about being stared at. Let them stare all they like, she thought. You go and get cleaned up and I'll tell the taxi to leave. We'll wait here till the train leaves, yeah? He asked. Annie wiped away her tears with her hand and all she could do was nod her head in agreement with what Jessie had just said. She couldn't even think properly, let alone make any sort of plan. Annie couldn't help but admire Jessie all the more for being so masterful in this crisis, and also for the way he had stepped in and taken charge. She didn't know what she would have done without him. After Annie had composed herself a little, she headed to the ladies' room. As she pushed the door open, she saw Sarah. Chapter 11 Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5 Sarah Sarah looked up in surprise from drying her hands. Annie, what are you doing here? Now that she had located Sarah, Annie was immediately fearful that she might not be able to persuade her sister to come back home with her. I've come to take you home. How did you know I was here? Ephraim said that John was going back to Ohio, Annie said. Then the words proceeded out of Sarah's mouth, the words that Annie was dreading. Annie, I'm not coming home with you. I'm going with John. I love him. Annie leaned against the starkness of the gray, cold wall tiles. Where are you going to stay? I'm going to stay with John and his family. You may as well know that he's not Amish. His parents left when he was a baby and he's grown up English. He was thinking of going back to live the Amish lifestyle, and he even borrowed Ephraim's clothes while he was staying with him. Annie didn't care to hear about John, and quickly searched her head for something, anything that would make Sarah come home with her. Does he love you too, Sarah? Yes, of course he loves me. What's more, he's going to show me how to get my GED and go to college. Sarah's tone was defensive. You can't just run away. That's not a proper way to start a life together. If he loves you, he'll wait for you. Come back home and wait till Dad agrees you can go on Rumspringa. Running away will only hurt Mom and Dad. Remember what they went through when Kate left? Sarah remained silent. She turned her back on Annie and splashed cold water on her face. Annie tried a different approach. If he loves you, he will wait for you, and you can do things properly. Leave in a way that will hurt no one, or you might regret it. You don't want to be shunned or anything, do you? After a few moments, Sarah turned to Annie. I don't think I'd be shunned, but all right. I will come home for a little while, but I won't be staying. I'll come back just for Mom and Dad. Her voice was cold. Annie pushed a few stray blonde hairs back under Sarah's prayer cap. Sarah took a deep breath and straightened herself up. Just take me home, can you? Annie looked at herself in the huge mirror above the basins. That's why we came. Sarah used a paper towel to blow her nose. We? Jessie's here too. We came in a taxi, Annie told her. At that moment, Sarah noticed her sister's face. Annie, have you been crying? Yeah, I didn't know where you were, that's all. Annie turned on the cold water tap and splashed her face with the cool water. Oh, Annie, I'm so sorry. 
Did mom and dad find my note? Annie nodded and wiped her face with some of the paper towels. Yeah, they're really distraught, of course. I couldn't have gone home without you. Sarah pouted. The whole thing is awful. How can I go home and face mom and dad now? Sarah looked like she was going to cry. Horror struck at Annie's heart at the notion of her changing her mind. How can you not? They will just be happy that you're home. Now let's go and find Jessie so we can go back home. Sarah gave Annie a big squeeze with both arms around her waist until Annie could hardly breathe. Once Annie saw that Sarah was going to go home and not change her mind, her heart was filled with gratefulness to God for having answered their prayer. Annie realized that Jesse would be still worried about Sarah, and she'd been in the bathroom for so long he would be worried about her now, too. As they left the ladies' restroom, they looked around for Jesse. They finally saw him in the corner of the room speaking with John. From their body language, it was obvious to Annie that they were having a heated argument. Jesse's voice rose and it looked to Annie as though he may hit John. Annie rushed over as fast as she could and yelled to distract him from doing something that he would later regret. Jesse! Jesse turned to look at Annie and just as he did, John punched Jesse hard in the side of his head. Jesse was knocked to the ground. Annie and Sarah were so shocked to see that Jesse had been knocked to the ground that they could only stare at him as he staggered to his feet. In Jesse's eyes was a look of absolute fury. For as long as she'd known him, Annie had never seen such anger in Jesse's eyes. It scared her so much that she tugged on his strong, muscular arm. No, Jesse. She tried to pull him away, but he pulled his arm out of her grasp. Sarah stood between the two men. Don't hurt him, Jesse. Sarah, you're here, Jesse said. Annie was pleased that Sarah had distracted Jesse from retaliation. Yeah, she's here so we can go now. She's coming back with us. Annie emphasized the word now to give Jesse the idea that it was a good idea to go right now, before any more trouble started and before Sarah changed her mind. As it was, everyone was looking their way, and a man in a security uniform strode toward them, speaking into a two-way radio. Jesse stepped away from John. They had accomplished what they had come to do, and that was to find Sarah. Sarah turned to John. I can't go with you. What? He said. The look on John's face was pure devastation. It seemed to Annie that his feelings for Sarah obviously ran very deep. John glanced at Annie and then at Jesse. They can't make you do anything that you don't want to do, Sarah. Just come with me, he ordered. Tears rolled down Sarah's face. No, John. I've decided I must go back. I have to do it properly. I can't just run away. John pulled Sarah aside with both hands on her shoulders. I'll be waiting for you, Sarah. I'll wait, he said. His words just made Sarah cry all the more. She turned her back to him and said to Annie and Jesse, Let's go. Annie held on to Jesse's arm, in fear of Jesse losing his temper with John. Pay him no mind, Jesse. Let's just be glad to get away from here. Once they were in a taxi, Annie looked at Jesse's head. How are you feeling? Your head looks mighty sore. I'll be okay. Jesse put his head back in the seat and closed his eyes. I'll just have a little rest now, he said. Thank you, Annie, and you too, Jesse, for coming to get me. I feel so stupid, Sarah said. Jesse didn't respond, and Annie said, No need to feel stupid, Sarah. Just don't do anything like that again. You nearly gave Dad a heart attack, I think. They'll be so pleased to see you, Sarah. Annie put her arm around Sarah. I'm so happy to have found you. Annie wanted to scold her sister but could see that she was in a fragile state and would be in no frame of mind to listen to a scolding. Annie was grateful that Jesse remained silent. He probably wanted to give her a piece of his mind as well. What had she been thinking by just up and running away like that? Annie hoped that Sarah hadn't compromised herself with John, yet she knew it would do no good to ask her of that now. Jesse was asleep in the taxi so Annie thought it best to drop Sarah at home and then go back to Jessie's place and continue home in her buggy. When the taxi pulled up at their house, Sarah's mother came running out to meet her. Annie thought she must have been waiting at the window the whole time that Sarah had been gone. Sarah was quickly ushered into the house by both parents who were delighted that she was home. Annie continued in the taxi with Jessie for a few moments more, until they arrived at Jessie's house. Jessie, wake up. You're home. Jesse staggered out of the taxi, and as he stood up, Annie thought that he might faint. She had to hold him up by propping her shoulder under his arm, and then she walked him to the porch. I'm all right, Annie, really, he said. 
Sit here and I'll make us a pot of coffee. He pointed to the two large chairs on the porch near the front door. No, you sit out here and I'll make a pot of coffee, she demanded. Sounds even better, he replied. Jesse managed to laugh a little as he sat down where he'd been told. Annie put the coffee on the table in between them and poured out the hot coffee into two mugs. While that's cooling a little, I'll take a look at your head. No, no, don't fuss, woman. He pushed her hand away. Annie ignored his protests. I will. I'll just have a little look. As she inspected his head, she saw that the skin was badly grazed, and he would most likely have a very bad bruise and maybe even a black eye. Yeah, I think it will be okay. I told you. Jesse put the steaming hot coffee up to his lips and took a sip. Mmm, why does your coffee taste so much better than mine? He asked. Annie was very tired, but she managed a little smile. Things like that always taste better when someone else makes it for you, she replied. Annie filled her lungs with the fresh evening air of the farm. How different it smelled to the air where they were just a few hours before. The air in the city smelled stale and of petrol and car fumes. Nothing at all like the clean, fresh air at home. Annie followed the direction of Jesse's gaze as he looked across the fields. It was then that she realized that she'd taken up nearly a whole day of his time and she immediately felt guilty. She knew he had a really tight schedule with the farm and trying to build up his horse business. Jesse, I'm so sorry to take up the whole day today when you could have been working. Nonsense, Annie. Your family has been like my own family ever since I can remember. And anyway, the community always comes first before anything, he replied. Annie wondered if that was all it was. Was he being so helpful for her sake in particular? Or was he helping her family? Annie would have liked it if he had helped her because he was in love with her. Yeah, that would be nice. Whatever the reason, Jesse missing a whole day's work meant that he would be way behind with his farm work. Well, could I do something to help? I can do work with the horses or something to help out, she suggested. No, I won't have you doing men's work, he replied. Annie laughed as he sounded just like her dad. That's old-fashioned. Women do all sorts of things now. Look at Kate. She works at the tailors, and lots of Amish women run their own businesses now as well. Yeah, that's true, but I'll not put you to work for me. No, I won't. Jesse crossed his arms in front of his chest, as if his mind was made up and there was no changing it. Annie shrugged her shoulders and couldn't help smiling, just a little. Annie thought that if she ever did marry Jesse, she would ask her mom how she changes her dad's mind about things. Jesse, I would stay and cook you dinner, but it wouldn't be right since you live alone and there's no one else here. Annie was concerned about Jesse. He still didn't look quite right and she thought that he might faint if he tried to stand up. I've got a chicken pie that Kate made me. I can just heat it up. I'll be fine, he said. Annie felt awful leaving him there all alone. Are you sure? You could come back with me and have dinner at my house if you'd like. There's always more than enough food and you know you're always welcome there. No, thank you. I'll heat up the pie and have an early night and then tomorrow I'll be back to normal, he said as he took a large mouthful of his coffee. Ah, that's making me feel much better already. Annie smiled and put her lips to her steaming hot mug. She felt that Jesse was a man who would always protect her and look after her. She admired the way he had stepped in and taken charge of the situation, as soon as he'd heard the news that Sarah was missing. Sure, he had his funny old-fashioned ways about what men and women should do, but Annie didn't mind that as her dad had those ideas as well. Surely Jesse wouldn't fall in love with an Englisher. He seemed so Amish in his thinking and in his ways. Yeah, he surely wouldn't, Annie decided. Annie waited a little while until she saw that the color had returned to Jesse's face. Well, if you're certain you'll be all right, I'll go home. Annie was at last a little confident that Jesse would be okay. Yeah, thank you. I'll be fine. I'll help you hitch the buggy, he replied. Annie always hitched the buggy herself, so was quite used to doing so, but she knew any protests from her would surely be ignored. By the time Annie arrived home, Sarah was fast asleep in bed. Annie would talk to her tomorrow to make sure that any thoughts of running away or seeing John again were far from her sister's mind. Annie was pleased to get into her safe, warm bed at the end of the very stressful day. Her mom had kept busy all day by washing all the bedding while watching and waiting for Sarah to return home. Annie took a deep breath, inhaling the smell of the freshly washed cotton sheets that had been dried by the sun, while her mind replayed the events of the day. 
It was clear that Jesse and she worked well together in a crisis. It was though they were a real team. It felt good to be so close to him, even if the reason wasn't quite ideal. Surely he can see how good we are together, she thought. If it weren't for Liz, I would think he liked me very much. But could I be mistaken, and he's not interested in me at all? I once thought he liked me, but then he also likes Liz, of that I'm sure. Maybe he just thinks of me as a sister, the sister that he never had. Annie knew she wouldn't be able to sleep a wink that night if she were going to keep thinking about Jesse and trying to work out where his heart lay. Annie decided that she would put all thoughts of Jesse out of her head for a while, and tomorrow she would do something she hadn't done in a while, and that was visit her sister, Kate. Tomorrow will be Saturday. Kate will be home so I will go and see her after my chores are finished, Annie decided. Chapter 12 And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2 Saturday mornings were usually scheduled for the two sisters to tend the vegetable garden. Annie was pleased that they would be working together that morning so she could have a chance to speak with Sarah about her future. Annie reached the garden before her sister. As fall was approaching, the garden was not as colorful as it was in the summer or the spring. The marigolds that were planted amongst the vegetables to keep the pests away had almost finished blooming. The garden was a little dry, and Annie made a mental note to remind Jacob to water it. The water supply for the garden came from the well behind the house. Jacob always complained that it took too much of his time. It was clearly his least favorite chore. Once Sarah joined her in the garden, Annie asked, How are you feeling about things today, Sarah? Annie could tell that Sarah was feeling pretty awful. I'm feeling quite bad about the whole thing. I feel awful that you and Jesse had to come bring me back. And I've upset John and I miss him so much. I hope he doesn't think I'm not in love with him anymore, Sarah replied. Annie noticed that Sarah's voice had been breaking up while she was speaking. She looked at her sister to see tears spilling down her cheeks. No, I don't think he'd think that. He would realize you want to do things properly. You'll be all right, Sarah. Annie wasn't sure what to say to her. I only came back because of Mom and Dad, but I really miss John, Sarah said. You're here now, so that's what counts. Don't be upset. It appeared that nothing would stop her sister from crying and Annie had a moment's concern about separating her from John. John said that we're living in a time warp. He told me all about the English world. Annie wasn't quite sure what a time warp was, but it was quite clear that Sarah wasn't going to forget John anytime soon. Annie tried not to think about what other things John might have filled her head with. By the time Annie had thought so much that her head was spinning, the garden had no weeds in it at all. Annie noticed that Sarah was staring at a bunch of marigolds. The English world is not as good as it seems, Sarah. There's a reason we stay separate from the world and keep to ourselves, Annie said. Yeah, I know. I may not stay in the English world, but I do want to experience it. It's my right to do that, Annie. Annie agreed with her, but did so reluctantly. She had hoped that once Sarah came home, she would forget all thoughts of leaving the community and all thoughts of John, especially now John had gone back to Ohio. Even though Annie didn't like it, she realized that she wasn't always going to be able to protect Sarah from everything. Sarah was now a full-grown woman. She had to make her own decisions and make her own choices. The distance to Kate and Benjamin's house wasn't worth Annie hitching the buggy for the fact that she could take a shortcut through the fields. She'd had her talk with Sarah and finished the washing, so apart from helping with the meal in the middle of the day and helping with dinner, she had no other duties that day. As she hurried across the fields, Annie looked down at her hands which were now so cold they were almost blue, which she put down to having just finished washing two loads of clothes. How Annie disliked doing the washing, especially her brother Jacob's clothes. They were always so muddy and dirty that it took ages to scrub them clean on the washboard, since the gas-powered washing machine had broken down. At least he's having fun at the pond while he's getting his clothes so dirty, fishing and catching tadpoles, she thought. Annie recalled how much fun she had playing when she was young. Her sisters and she would play often with Benjamin and Jesse with the animals at their farm. There were always dogs, cats, kittens, puppies, and sometimes piglets to play with. Annie smiled as she remembered the good old days, the days where she didn't have to think of her future or her present. Those were the days where she didn't have a care in the world. 
She could even spend time with Jesse and not have to worry where his eyes were wandering and who they were wandering to. In those days, even their chores were a lot more fun because they would sing and play together as they worked. Time flew by very quickly. Annie pulled her black coat tightly across her chest in an effort to keep out the bone-chilling wind that was sweeping across the field. Leaves fell about her feet as she took each step. Annie looked up at the trees to see that they had hardly any leaves left to drop. She admired the intricate pattern of branches revealed by the absence of leaves, and marveled how each tree was uniquely different. How wonderful is God's handiwork, she thought. He designs every tree so individually and carefully. No two are the same. Annie appreciated that God designed every little branch on every tree in the whole wide world and ordered the leaves to fall when the timing was right. Annie recalled her dad's reading from the Psalms a couple of nights ago. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. God is truly an artist. His designs are all around us. Annie was always so busy and her head full of so many thoughts all the time that she scarcely took time to appreciate the beauty that surrounded her. Today, however, she took notice of every little thing. So overcome was she by the beauty that surrounded her that she sat down on the cold grass and stared up at the sky, suddenly in awe of the greatness of God. The sky was clear and bright blue, yet as it reached the horizon it faded to a much paler blue. The shades of yellow in the fields perfectly complemented the depths of color in the sky. Annie became aware that cold air was rushing against her cheeks. She closed her eyes and concentrated on the feel of the breeze against her face. She took a long, slow, deep breath, filling her lungs with the crisp, fresh air. Thank you, God, for your beautiful designs. Annie suddenly felt very small in a very big world. All my concerns are nothing in this world. If God can make this world so beautiful and perfect, then he has my life in his hands, and I need not be concerned with my small worries. The scripture in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 sprung into her mind. Fret not about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Annie, are you trying to catch your death of cold? Annie was jolted out of her quietness and opened her eyes suddenly to see Jesse nearly upon her. She jumped to her feet and noticed that he had a badly bruised black eye. Jesse, look at you. You've got a black eye. I'm all right. It's nothing. I was just going to start working and I saw you sitting over here. What are you doing? he asked. He did look better than yesterday, and it was clear that his strength had returned to him, but his black eye looked very painful. Well, I'm just on my way to Kate's house and I was just taking a moment to admire God's handiwork. This time of year is so beautiful. Jessie sat down on the ground and motioned for her to sit back down. It's certainly something, isn't it? But you shouldn't be sitting here on the cold ground and in this chilling wind, he said. Neither should you, she replied. Annie felt warm and fuzzy inside at his concern and sat back down on the cold ground. They were silent for a while before Jesse spoke. This is my favorite time of year. It's not too hot and not too cold, he said. I like it when it's really cold and I can get in front of the fire. Annie thought how warm she would be if Jesse put his arms around her. Maybe one day I will be able to feel his warm arms around me. Jesse leaned back onto his elbows. Well, that'll be coming soon enough. It's so cold today he replied. I best be going. I've got to get to Kate's and then be home to help with the midday meal. Annie arranged her dress so she could stand up modestly. Jesse sprang to his feet and offered Annie his hand. Annie took his hand and stood up. She didn't know whether she rose too quickly or whether it was the close proximity of Jesse that caused her to swoon, but all of a sudden her head started to swim. The next thing she knew was that she was lying down on the cold grass with her eyes closed. Annie! Annie! he said. She could feel Jessie's hand gently tapping her on the cheek, and with quite an effort she managed to open her eyes. She could see the blue sky and Jessie's fuzzy outline. She realized that she must have fainted and tried to sit up. No, stay there. Don't sit up too soon. You fainted. Jessie took his coat off and covered her with it. After a few moments her strength returned. Jessie, I'm all right, truly, I can sit up. Jessie leaned over her and put a strong arm under her back. He helped her to sit up. Thank you. Whatever is the matter with you? Have you eaten today? He asked. Annie remembered she hadn't eaten that morning and she hadn't eaten the night before. I've had so much on my mind with having to find Sarah and everything. I didn't have dinner last night and I don't remember eating this morning. Annie, you must eat. Look at you. 
There's nothing of you, he replied. Annie's head started to hurt, and the last thing she needed was a lecture. Sit for a while before you try and stand up, Jessie continued. Annie was more concerned about Jessie than she was about herself. What about you? How are you feeling after yesterday? She asked. The good night's sleep and Kate's pie must have done the job because I feel fine today. Jessie laughed. I may not look fine, but I feel fine, he said. Annie thought that he still looked mighty fine to her, even with a bruised black eye. I'll try and stand now, she said. Jessie put his hand under her back and helped her up. Once she was standing up, she realized just how close Jessie was to her. Not only that, his arm was still tightly around her back. She looked up into his face and saw that his eyes were transfixed on her lips. She held her breath, and her heart started to beat wildly. They stood there like that for what was longer than a moment, until Jessie removed his arm. Annie was embarrassed at their shared moment. She dusted herself off and handed Jessie back his coat. Thank you. I'll walk with you to Kate's house in case you faint again. I'm sure you'll feel much better when you have something to eat, he said. No, I'm fine, Jessie. It's not far now. Besides, I'm sure you've got a lot to do today and I don't want to take up any more of your time, she replied. Jessie put his coat back on. No, I will walk with you just in case I have to carry you if you faint again. Annie giggled. What are you going to do with your day? I'm going to see the bishop later today, he replied. Annie gasped and hoped her shock wasn't obvious. Is he going to see him about Liz to tell the bishop he is in love with an Englisher? What for? Her words were out before she could take them back. She dreaded his answer. I believe I got too angry at John and I acted in a way that I'm not happy about, and something else as well, he told her. I'm right. He said something else so he is going to see the bishop about Liz. I thought you showed self-control, Jesse. You walked away. You could have hit him back and you didn't, she said. Jesse kicked a pebble on the ground as they walked. In my heart I wanted to hurt him. I still hold anger and bitterness in my heart against him. I don't want to harbor these feelings. No good comes from anger, he said. His heart must be toward God, Annie thought. If he wants to talk with the bishop, that's a good thing. And if he is in love with Liz, then who am I to stand in the way of love? Maybe Liz will come back to the community, and that is God's plan. As they walked in the field by themselves, Annie wished that she were the one who had pulled away when they were standing so close to each other. Now he may think I haven't got good morals. I don't want to kiss a man before I marry. So why didn't I pull away first? Why was he holding on to me so tightly, only to release me moments later? Didn't he want to kiss me? My world would be perfect if he loved me, she thought as she walked beside him. As I walk next to him these last few hundred feet, I will imagine to myself that we are courting. Annie's heart filled with light and gladness for those last few hundred feet. It was only when she reached Kate's house and saw Kate tending the garden that she snapped herself back to reality. Chapter 13 The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life, and have it to the full. John 10.10 10. Kate. Kate looked up and waved to Annie and Jesse who were walking toward her. Kate hugged Annie and tried to usher them both inside. I've just finished the gardening. I'll put a pot of coffee on for us, she said. I can't stay, Kate. I'm just delivering this young lady to you, he told her. Kate was clearly disappointed. Are you sure, Jesse? Yeah, I've got quite a bit to get through today, but I'll visit soon, he said, before he turned and strode away. Kate linked her arm through Annie's and took her through to the kitchen. Annie sat down at the large table in the kitchen and noticed that Kate had her sewing machine set up and was sewing a quilt. Oh, Kate, it's going to be a wonderful quilt. The colors are so pretty. It was a diagonal pattern with soft blues and greens. Kate got two mugs out of the utility room while she waited for the water to boil. I'm glad you like it. It's for you. Annie put her hand to her mouth. For me? Kate laughed at Annie's reaction. Yeah, not just for now, for when you get married. Annie laughed as well. I don't think that will be any time soon. Kate pinched her lips together. Well, I'll put it away for you. I have to have something to sew when I'm not at work. Annie often thought of how lucky Kate was to have a wonderful man like Benjamin, and how wonderful it was that he'd surprised Kate by building her a handsome house. You are very blessed, Kate. You've got a lovely house and garden. 
You get to work at the tailor's, and Benjamin is such a good man. Kate carefully poured the hot coffee into the mugs. Yeah, I thank God for my life every day, and another thing, I think I'm expecting. What? Oh, Kate, that's wonderful. When will you know for sure? Kate walked the coffee mugs over to the table and placed one in front of Annie. In about three weeks, I think. Don't tell anyone, yeah? I've got to be sure and I want to wait a while after that, too. Annie couldn't wait to have a baby in the family. She decided that she had better not appear too over-enthusiastic in case Kate wasn't expecting after all. Annie also decided in Kate's condition it would be best not to tell her what had just happened with Sarah, as she didn't want to worry her. Besides that, Annie was sure that Sarah would never do anything like that again. Does Benjamin know you might be expecting? Yeah, he is excited, but is trying not to think about it because he doesn't want to be upset if we're not having a baby after all. Benjamin wants a really big family. Annie figured that Kate must have seen Jesse recently because she'd baked him that chicken pie that Jesse was speaking of. Do you see much of Jesse? Yeah, he's here a lot for dinner. It's hard for him to do all that hard work and then cook for himself as well. He's already doing two jobs now with his horse interests. Annie nodded and knew what her sister was going to say next. He really needs a good wife. Kate looked at Annie and smiled. Know anyone? Stop it, Kate. Annie picked up the coffee and took a sip of the steaming hot liquid. No, it's clear that Jesse hasn't mentioned a thing about Liz to Benjamin. Or if he had mentioned it to Benjamin, then Benjamin had not mentioned the subject to Kate. Annie silently reasoned. I wonder if he will talk over his love for Liz with the bishop when he goes to see him. Annie. Annie looked up from her coffee to see that Kate had been snapping her fingers in front of her face to try and get her attention. You were a million miles away. What were you thinking? Kate asked. Annie gave an answer that Kate would find reasonable. I was wondering if you were going to offer me any of that blueberry cake over there. Well, she wasn't exactly lying. She was thinking she better eat something soon. But she was also thinking how different and odd things would be for her if Liz and Jesse were to marry. That night, Liz whispered to Annie over dinner that she had something to tell her. Straight after the Bible readings, Annie went up to Liz's room and quietly knocked on her door. Liz, she whispered. Come in, Annie. Annie opened the door and stepped inside Kate's old bedroom that Liz had converted into a colorful bedroom, and a bedroom which would normally have no place in an Amish house. Liz sat up in bed with a white fur shawl wrapped around her shoulders. Annie sat on the end of her bed, slightly uncomfortable in the bright and brassy surroundings. What is it? Annie asked. Well, you know how I told you that I like someone? Annie took a deep breath. She was sure she wasn't going to like what Liz had to say next. Yeah? Well, I'm so happy. He likes me too. Liz threw back her head and laughed. That's wonderful. I'm so happy for you. That explains why Jesse's hasn't been spending so much time with me, she thought. He's obviously had some positive advice from the bishop regarding Liz. Oh, Annie, I've never been so happy. He's so lovely, so gentle, and so kind. Liz put her hands over her heart and closed her eyes. Yeah, Jesse is all those things. Does that mean you might come back to the community? That's most likely God's plan, Annie reasoned. That's the other thing I was going to tell you. I told him that I could never come back to the Amish and could never live the Amish ways again. I told him I'd have to live in the English world, otherwise I could never marry him. What did he say about that? Annie nearly said, what did Jesse say about that? But she stopped herself just in time, remembering that Liz hadn't actually revealed his identity to her yet. He said that he would consider leaving for me. Annie gasped and put her hand to her mouth. Jesse leaving the community? Her first thoughts were the farm. The farm was struggling, and if Jesse couldn't do his share of the work, that would mean that Benjamin might have to sell the farm that had been in their family for generations. Would Jesse know what he's getting himself in for? Living in the English world and being distracted by worldly things? Which may take him away from God. Annie, it's not that shocking. People leave the Amish all the time. Liz's tone was a little harsh. Annie remained silent and realized that Jesse wasn't baptized yet. Was he waiting to see whether he wanted to leave or not before he was baptized? He must be leaving a window of opportunity open for himself. Was that what he was speaking to the bishop about? I'm sorry, Liz. I'm happy for you, really. It was true Annie was happy for Liz, but not happy for herself, not happy for Jesse, and not happy for her family who would miss Jesse so terribly when he was gone. Then a thought occurred to Annie. 
What if it wasn't Jesse who she loved? What if it was someone else? What's his name, Liz? Liz giggled for quite a while. I can't tell you that. Why not? Liz just shook her head and looked a little guilty. Annie didn't give up. Tell me something about him, then. Liz tipped her head slightly to the side and twirled a strand of her bleached blonde hair around one of her manicured fingers. I can tell you that you do know him. I can also tell you that he trades in horses. Annie felt as if a large knife had just driven straight through her heart. The only man Annie knew who fitted that description was Jesse. What pleasure can life offer me now? when the only man I ever wanted is so easily swayed by the looks of another woman. No, I'm being too harsh, Annie thought. Liz is a lovely girl. I can't deny either of them their happiness. I must not be so selfish. Annie felt she should cry, but she couldn't. All she could feel was numbness, and with that numbness, her zest for life had vanished. She even wondered what sadness this journey called life would bring her. What was to become of her? I'll be a lonely old spinster woman and the only comfort I will have will be nieces and nephews and, of course, the horses. What if it is God's will that I end up a cranky old dried-up spinster and die alone? Chapter 14 I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 2. Timothy 1.12 It was at their church meeting when Annie next saw Jesse. He was sitting across the way with the men and she was sitting with the women, as was usual. Annie was in a very good position where she could see Jesse out of the corner of her eye. Why did her eyes naturally gravitate to him? She consciously willed her eyes to stop straying in his direction. The next hymn they were singing was How Great Thou Art. Annie closed her eyes and all she could hear above all the other voices was Jesse's beautiful singing voice. How she loved to listen to Jesse sing. His voice always made her happy and made her feel close to God. The sound of his voice was so pure that it sounded like a bell, a pure, clear bell. That sound can only come from God, Annie thought. God has blessed him with his beautiful singing voice. She knew Jesse could easily sing so much louder than he was now, as she'd often heard him singing in the fields as he went about his work. Yeah, modesty restrains him from showing off his wonderful God-given voice. As she listened to Jesse sing the words, she heard that every sound he uttered was in perfectly accurate pitch. There was no music that accompanied their songs, only the voices of the members of the church. Annie got shivers all over her body as she felt as if she was right in God's presence, right now in heaven, right then and there, while she listened to his beautiful, clear voice. After the singing was finished, Annie glanced over in the general direction of Jesse and accidentally caught his eye. She immediately looked away. Oh no, I don't want him to think that I like him, she thought. That would be so embarrassing. She bit her lip and made a concentrated effort not to look in his direction again. Why was she so drawn to him, though? If God had planned for him to be with Liz, then why did she feel this need to be with him all the time? Why were her thoughts constantly of Jesse? Is God testing me? Annie could not concentrate on a thing that the bishop was saying. She wished she could go straight back home without staying for the meal afterward. But she couldn't. It was too far to walk in the cold. And besides, she had to drive the buggy since her dad had failing eyesight. She even considered going home and coming back later to pick her family up. But they would want to know why she hadn't stayed. There was nothing else she could do but stay for the meal. Annie wondered why Jesse hadn't been to see the family in quite some days. Annie decided that he must be deliberately avoiding her because he hadn't even been to see her dad with whom he was very close. She had tried to stop thinking about Jesse, and she had even been avoiding Liz in an effort to avoid Liz's talk of him. Annie would have to face Jesse tonight, because tonight at dinner was when Benjamin and Kate were to announce their exciting news to the family. Annie was the only one who knew that Kate was expecting. Tonight, everyone else would be able to share in the knowledge of welcoming a new baby to the family. Annie looked around and saw Jesse walking toward her. She immediately turned and walked away from him and toward Kate in an effort to avoid talking to him. Annie, there you are, Kate exclaimed. I'm excited to be telling Mom and Dad about the baby. Oh, and everyone else, too, of course. Annie said, They will be so excited. Kate looked carefully into Annie's face. What's wrong? Annie looked around to make sure she couldn't be overheard. Did you know that Jesse and Liz like each other? Kate glanced over Annie's shoulder. 
Hush, Jesse's walking this way. Hello, you two. How are you on this fine day? He asked. Kate spoke first. Hello, Jesse. I'm sorry. I must go and help Benjamin with something. Annie was annoyed with her sister for trying to leave her alone with Jesse. What good would that do now? I'll help you. No, you stay here. Kate turned to leave. It's something only I can help him with. Annie felt a little embarrassed. It must seem obvious to Jesse that staying to speak with him was the last thing that she wanted to do. So did you speak to the bishop? She asked. Jesse nodded. Yeah, I did, he replied. So are you going to hell? She asked. Annie thought it a horrid thing to say, but that's how she was feeling inside. Horrid. Jesse looked surprised and laughed. I certainly hope not. No, I don't think so. I do feel a lot better for speaking with him, though, he said. That's good. Annie wanted to tell him how much she loved listening to the beautiful, warm sound of his singing voice. She wanted to tell him she longed to be near him all the time. She wanted to tell him that she couldn't stop thinking of the day they had been alone in the fields when he had tenderly covered her with his coat. But all she could do was stand there with her arms folded against her chest and look cranky. And how have you been? No more fainting spells? He asked. Annie shook her head. No, was all she could manage to say. Jesse stood there for a while longer and then said, Well, I'll see you at dinner tonight then. Annie nodded, pleased that he was leaving. Things between them had gotten so awkward. It was bad enough that he was going to be there for dinner that night. This was also the first time that Jesse had come to dinner since Liz had told her that Jesse and she were in love. To make matters worse, Liz was supposed to have left by now, but she was still living there in the house with no further talk of leaving. Most likely so she can still keep seeing Jesse and trying to pry him away from his home, Annie thought. On Sundays, the Amish were supposed to do very little work, but Annie wanted to continue training her new horse, to get him used to the carriage. It's not really work anyway, Annie reasoned. Annie had hitched the harness to him days before and taken him up and down in front of the barn, and he had handled everything perfectly. This time I will take him a little ways up the road, Annie decided. As Annie had nearly finished hitching the buggy, she saw Sarah coming toward her with a basket. Annie, Mom saw you hitching the buggy and she said, can you take this food to Mrs. Lapp? She's quite sick and couldn't make it to church. That's perfect, Annie thought. Mrs. Lapp lived very close by and Annie thought it a perfect distance to take flighty. Being a Sunday, that would mean not much traffic as well. Annie was enjoying the day as flighty clip-clopped along the quiet roads. The October air was crisp and yet the sun gently warmed her skin. The trip was relaxing and flighty had behaved perfectly all the way to Mrs. Lapp's place. Now they were heading home and it looked like Flighty was going to make a fine buggy horse after all. Annie was wondering what Jesse was worried about when all of a sudden a car passed them way too closely and blew their horn. The horn was much louder than a normal car horn, and it sounded for some time in a sort of musical tune. It frightened the life out of Annie and Flighty as well. Flighty reared up and then bolted up the road. Annie pulled on the reins as hard as she could until her knuckles were white, but there was no stopping him. Finally. Annie managed to get him under control and she pulled him off to the side of the road. She was grateful that no other cars or buggies were about while he was bolting. She got out of the buggy and tried to calm Flighty down by talking softly to him. Annie was concerned as he was layered in a thick lather of white sweat and made loud snorting noises out of his nostrils. At that point, Annie was scared to drive him the rest of the way home and thought she may have to lead him all the way back. She could hear a familiar clip-clop of hoofbeats and looked up to see Jesse's buggy coming toward her. Thank you, God, she murmured quietly. He stopped his buggy and walked briskly toward her. Annie, are you all right? What's happened? Jesse got out of his buggy and stood next to her by Flighty's head. A car spooked him deliberately and he bolted and I couldn't stop him for ages. I'm trying to quiet him down, she told him. Jesse shook his head. Annie knew for sure and for certain that he was a little annoyed that she hadn't followed his advice. I know you said he's a bit excitable, but Mom just wanted me to take something to Mrs. Lapp and it was such a short distance that I thought it would be okay. Sensing Jesse would soon give her a lecture, she added, Also, it's Sunday, so the road is normally a lot quieter. Jesse checked that Flighty didn't have heat and swelling in his legs. I hope you're going straight home now, he asked. Yeah, of course. Jesse checked the buggy over to make sure it was safe and hadn't been damaged anywhere. Take my buggy home and I'll follow you in this one, he said. Annie realized it wasn't a question. It was more of an order. 
Annie was pleased with his suggestion, as she never would have admitted that she was a little scared to drive Flighty home. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. She was also pleased that Jessie didn't give her the lecture that she was expecting, although she suspected that she had only escaped it for now. When they arrived back at Annie's house, Jessie helped unhitch the buggy. I've called him Flighty. Jessie laughed. True to his name, I'd say. Annie watched Jessie's strong arms unhitch the buggy. She was pleased to have some help from a man as she usually did everything for the horses by herself. Jessie turned around quickly and saw Annie watching him. I'm really worried about you, Annie. There are too many buggy accidents lately and the people driving the cars don't seem to understand that buggies can't go as fast as cars, especially the out-of-towners who aren't used to buggies, he said. Annie's mind immediately went to the tragic buggy accident in the county some years back, where Jessie's parents were killed. She had never asked the details as it upset her too much to even think about it. Jessie led Flighty to his stable and then turned to Annie. Let me help you train him. I would really appreciate that, Jessie. Thank you. What happened today scared me quite a bit, she replied. Jessie gave a bit of a laugh. Yeah, I could tell you were very frightened, he said. Annie defiantly set her hands upon her hips. How could you tell? I thought I was hiding it rather well. I know you, Annie. I can tell what you are thinking and I can tell what you are feeling. Well, most of the time anyway, he said. Annie fell silent. If what he was saying were true, that would mean that he knows that I am in love with him. Okay, I will close my eyes and think of something. And when I open my eyes, you will tell me what I was thinking, yeah? Jessie grinned. All right then. Annie closed her eyes and concentrated on the words. I like you. I like you. After a moment, she opened her eyes to see Jessie standing in front of her, very, very close. Annie got a fright at how close he was and immediately took a step backward. Well then, she asked. Jessie took a step forward and closed the distance between them. You like me. Annie looked into his eyes and wanted with all her heart to say, Yes, I like you. At that moment, she was sure that his response would have been that he liked her too. She could see the love for her in his eyes that were transfixed upon hers. All she could do was giggle, put both hands on his chest and push him away. Then she ran into the safety of her house, and as he was to have dinner there that night, Jessie followed shortly after. Chapter 15 Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Psalm 23 4. As they all sat down to eat, reality assaulted Annie's mind. Yes, she thought Jesse loved her, yet he also seemed to like Liz. It was awkward having a meal with the man she loved, not knowing where his true affections lay. As they all sat down to eat, Kate made her announcement. We're having a baby! Annie had never seen her parents so animated. They leaped from their chairs and hugged Kate. Annie was sure she saw a tear trying to escape from her dad's eye. That was the first time that Annie had ever seen her father cry. Right now, it was the most emotion he had ever shown, as far as Annie could remember, apart from the time that Sarah had run away. Jesse let out a holler. I'm going to be an uncle, he said. Jacob was also very pleased. Can I look after him, please? He asked. Everyone laughed and Benjamin said, What makes you think it's going to be a boy? It could be a girl. Jacob pulled a face. No, I hope not. I want someone to play with. When he gets bigger, of course. Someone to take to the creek, maybe? Sarah asked. Yeah. Jacob looked very pleased and put a huge forkful of chicken into his mouth. Annie had taken the last few weeks to take the time to actually learn how to cook. She was determined to be able to cook as well as her mother and her sister, Sarah. She had cooked the meal that night. It just happened to have been Jesse's favorite food. Annie had made his favorite pumpkin pie for dessert and for dinner, oven fried chicken with vegetables. She'd also made a second dessert of blueberry cake, which was one of Kate's favorites. Annie knew that she would make Jessie a wonderful wife, if only he were in love with her. He worked so hard and was always so ready to help anyone who asked him that Annie wanted to be able to set a hearty meal before him at the end of every day. The heavy smell of Liz's perfume hung in the air, and Annie realized her thoughts were frivolous, and the things that she was thinking of were not going to come to pass. She turned her attention back to the here and now. Liz turned to Kate. You're so lucky to be having a baby and a good man and a lovely home. 
Kate and Benjamin smiled into each other's eyes adoringly. Liz's words struck Annie. You will have that someday too, Liz. You are so beautiful that any man would be blessed indeed if you were his wife. Liz was undeniably one of the most beautiful women that Annie had seen. Annie, I'm surprised at you. It's the heart that men are drawn to, Jessie said. Annie nearly opened her mouth in shock at his statement. This coming from Jessie? He's the one who can't take his eyes off Liz. If she weren't sitting at the table with all her family, she may have been tempted to say just that to him. As Annie didn't reply, Jesse continued his line of thought. In Proverbs it says, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Jesse continued, Men may be foolishly attracted to the looks of a woman, but it's her heart and gentleness that keep him interested and make him fall in love with her, he said. Annie cast her eyes down. All the women at the table fell silent as the two men nodded their heads in agreement. Her dad agreed with Jessie and mumbled something about looks being vanity. When Annie eventually looked across the table at Jessie, he gave her a beaming smile. She quickly looked away. If she hadn't known he was in love with Liz, she would have given that smile a very different meaning. By quoting that scripture, he means that he was initially attracted by her beautiful looks. But now he realizes that she's got a good and gentle heart, and that's what's made him fall in love with her. It must be true love. Annie became annoyed. Jesse had given me the idea that he liked me some time back. I'm sure of it. Was he keeping his options open between Liz and myself? Maybe he was waiting to see if Liz liked him and if she didn't like him that he was going to court me. Annie was outraged at the thought of being someone's second choice. She wanted to be someone's only choice, not just their first choice. She wanted to be someone's only choice. Anyway, enough talk of this love business. Annie's dad nearly laughed as he spoke. Let's talk about something important. Like, what's for dessert? He asked. Annie and Jacob were the only ones at the table who did not laugh at their dad's words. Jacob didn't laugh because he thought that dessert was far more serious than love, and Annie didn't laugh because she was quite upset by the whole conversation. Annie rose from the table and started to clear the plates. I've made pumpkin pie, Jessie said. Oh, did you make it specially for me, Annie? Annie looked him in the eyes as she spoke. No. She wanted him to get the message loud and clear that she was not interested in him at all. If he wanted Liz, then he could have her. Everyone looked quite taken aback at the harsh tone in Annie's voice. I mean, no, I didn't know you were coming until after I'd started making it. She didn't want to appear rude in front of her family, especially not in front of Jacob, who was already a little cheeky and becoming rather a handful. After dinner was over and before the Bible reading started, Jessie found a quiet moment to speak to Annie. Annie, can I speak with you outside for a moment? He asked. Annie looked to her father and saw that he wasn't quite ready to start the Bible reading. Yeah, she replied. Jessie opened the door for Annie to walk through first. Annie sat down on a large wooden chair and Jessie sat on the one next to her. Jessie took a deep breath. Have I done something to upset you? He asked. No, not at all. She was upset that he liked Liz, but that wasn't something that was entirely his fault. He couldn't help who he fell in love with. Jessie studied her face. I know there's something wrong. You're not the same to me. It's like you are upset, but I can't think of anything I could have done to upset you. Annie was uncomfortable under his intense gaze and shifted in the chair. Jessie, I'm fine. You've done nothing to upset me. I've just got a lot of things on my mind with keeping an eye on Sarah and that sort of thing. Yeah, that would be a concern, he said. Well, we better get back in before Dad starts the reading. You staying for it? She asked. Jesse didn't look entirely convinced by her answers. He nodded that he was staying. Once Annie was back inside the house, she quietly excused herself from the Bible reading, saying that she didn't feel well, and went straight to her room. She sat quietly under her window, glad to have a few moments so she could quiet her mind. She stared up at the bright moon and enjoyed its beauty. How pretty the luminous moon is against the dark sky, and how pretty are the sparkling stars like a sprinkling of brightness. The Psalms say that, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I can definitely see the glory of God in the night sky. Annie tried to keep her mind off Jessie, but her discomfort about the whole situation kept nagging at her. I can understand why Kate left the community now. 
I wonder if I should just leave the community. Kate left and was away for four whole years and things worked out well for her. She got a good husband and is soon to be blessed with a baby. So maybe if I leave, things will work out for me as well. In time. No, that's just silly thinking. I could never leave. The very next night after dinner, Annie was drying the dishes when she heard footsteps on the porch. She peeked out the window and saw Jesse's buggy outside. No one else was around, so Annie answered his knock. Jesse was standing with his hat in his hands. Can we talk, Annie? he asked. Yeah, come in, she replied. Will you come outside so we can talk? He smiled at her. A chill went up and down Annie's spine. What if Liz saw them and got the wrong idea? To avoid upsetting Liz, she found her mom and quietly told her where she was going. As they walked outside the house in the moonlight, Jesse spoke. Annie, do you remember some time back when I offered to take you to the volleyball game? He asked. Yeah? Annie looked up at him and wondered where he was going with this line of conversation. Well, I was kind of hoping that we would be able to go to the volleyball alone. That's why I asked you. I didn't know that Sarah would be coming with us as well, he told her. Annie thought back to the incident. She had thought at the time he was hoping they'd be alone, but as time went by, she would began to doubt her instincts. Would you like to come on a buggy ride with me tomorrow night? He asked. Annie felt that all the air had suddenly left her lungs and she could hardly speak. She kept her eyes fixed on him, hoping that he wouldn't notice her lack of oxygen. Yeah, that would be nice. It was a wonder she managed to speak at all. How can this be? Jesse must like me after all. But what about Liz? Could I have been wrong this whole time about Liz? That was the only answer. Annie was elated. The man she loved, loved her back and had just asked her on a buggy ride. She wanted to shout it to the world. She wanted to spin around and around in a circle like she used to when she was a child. After their brief exchange, he said, I will call for you at eight. As soon as Jesse drove away, Annie decided that the only bad thing was that she had to wait a whole entire day for the buggy ride. From that point on, the buggy ride was the only thing that Annie could think of. As a buggy ride was the Amish way of dating, Annie knew that Jesse was seriously interested in her after all this time. She'd been in love with him for some years, and now he was finally returning her feelings. She knew he would make a very fine husband. He was a good church member and was kind, humble, patient, and a hard worker. But what of Liz? Was it finished between them? Liz was still at the house, but hadn't confided in her lately about how things were going. Jesse must have decided that he wasn't interested in Liz anymore. Annie decided she would not tell Liz of the buggy ride as she didn't want to hurt her feelings. Chapter 16 Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Job 12, 9 Annie felt a knot forming in her throat. They had been in the buggy for what must have been five minutes already, and the conversation was non-existent. Yet the chatter in Annie's head had been constant. She was thinking how she felt safe when Jesse was around. She was thinking how it pleased her when at times he'd shown how protective he was of her. She was also thinking how he was a godly man who would make her a wonderful husband. How ideal it would be to be married to Jesse and to live in his house so close to her parents. As if out of nowhere, a car passed them and nearly ran them off the road, while the driver yelled something out the window at them. Jesse instinctively swung the buggy over to the side of the road as far as was safe. Annie's heartbeat quickened. She looked at Jesse's shocked expression and burst out laughing. She didn't know whether it was nerves or whether it was genuinely the funny side of the situation she was laughing at. All she knew was that she was laughing so hard that tears were nearly coming to her eyes. Jesse tried to fix a serious expression on his face but before long he was joining with her laughter. After about ten minutes back on the road, Jesse pulled the buggy up along a little side road. I might check the buggy to see if everything is okay. I'm a bit concerned about one of the wheels. It seems to be shaking, he said. As Annie listened to the warm tones of Jesse's voice, she saw snowflakes gently falling from the sky. It's snowing, Annie said as she got out of the buggy and stood under the moonlit sky. Amongst the soft snowflakes, spread her arms out and slowly turned around. I love the snow. Come on, Jessie. Feel the snow. Jessie left off checking the wheel and mimicked her movements, which caused Annie to laugh some more. Jessie stopped spinning and stood and looked at Annie. I love to hear you laugh, he said. 
His words were spoken in a soft and loving tone, which sent shivers through Annie's body. Annie stopped spinning and turned to face him. Thank you. You're shivering, Jesse said as he whipped off his black coat, closed the distance between himself and Annie and swung it over her shoulders. He pulled it firmly in front of her. Annie's cheeks burned and her heart raced out of control. If she had been shivering, it wasn't from the cold. More than likely, she had been shivering from sheer nerves. And now to make matters worse, her heart was pounding incessantly against her chest. Jessie was standing so close to her that she could smell his warm, musky male scent. She inhaled deeply so she could imprint it upon her memory. He's standing so close. Is he going to try to kiss me? She closed her eyes and opened them slowly and saw his lips gravitating to hers. How she wanted to taste those lips and feel the warm softness against her own. But nerves caused her to pull away. We best be getting back, she said. Jesse cleared his throat. Yeah, it's probably getting late, he replied. The conversation on the way home was kept to talk about their families. All the way back, Annie was wondering if she should have let him kiss her. But she was nervous and didn't know whether she should kiss before marriage. She'd never given it much thought before, as Jesse was the first man she'd gone on a buggy ride with. She certainly didn't want to kiss him until she knew that he was seriously interested in her. What if I kissed him and we didn't end up getting married? That would make me tainted goods for my husband if I didn't marry Jesse. It wasn't long ago that his attention was taken with Liz. What if he's a fickle sort of a man with eyes that wander, she thought. Like they wandered to Liz constantly. Annie had to know how he felt about Liz. There was only one thing for it, to ask him. She gathered all her courage and asked him right then and there in the buggy. Do you ever see Liz? she asked. Jesse took his eyes momentarily off the road and gave a side glance at Annie. No, why would I see Liz? You appeared to have some fondness for her. He shook his head. No, I never had any fondness for her. Jesse's answer disappointed Annie. She would have had far more respect for Jesse if he had come straight out and at least admitted that he found her pleasing to his eyes and had been involved with her in some capacity. Annie turned toward him. You don't fool me, Jesse Yoder. I saw your eyes fixed upon her every time you were at the house for dinner, she said. Jesse gave a grunt. What? You thought I was interested in Liz as a girlfriend or something? He asked. I saw the way you stared at her all the time. You couldn't keep your eyes away. Annie thought she sounded like a jealous old wife, but at that point she didn't care. She just wanted Jesse to speak the truth to her. Jesse glanced in her direction and then his eyes turned back toward the dark road ahead. I may have been staring, but not because I liked what I saw. I was staring because she was painted up like a Christmas tree or like a loose woman. You know what a loose woman is, don't you? Jesse Yoder, that's a terrible thing to say about Liz. She's been a good friend to me and a very nice girl, she scolded him. Jesse's voice rose quite loudly, even louder than Annie's had been. Now listen to me, Annie. I wasn't saying anything about the person who Liz is, her character. I was speaking about how she dresses, that's all, he told her. Annie had never heard Jesse raise his voice. And another thing. I have to admit I was a little amazed that your dad let her parade around your house with the paint on her face, those clothes on her back and fingernails so long that they could accidentally poke someone's eye out. It would never be appropriate in my household, he said. Annie remained silent and let him finish. I told Benjamin I was going to say something and he advised me not to. He even kicked me under the table when he thought I might open my big mouth, he told her. Annie thought back to the kick that Benjamin had given his brother under the table. I remember that kick, and I thought it was for an entirely different reason. Benjamin said I was too hot-headed and that it wasn't my house and therefore it was really none of my concern, he said. Annie laughed and felt peace in her heart at the knowledge that she was not second choice to Liz in Jesse's affections. Dad would certainly have had something to say if it were one of his daughters wearing clothes like that. He definitely would not allow it. Jesse said, Is that why you seemed so angry with me sometimes? You thought I might have been lusting after Liz at the dinner table? He laughed. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought, she silently affirmed. It's not a laughing matter. Well, not to me it isn't, she replied. His voice softened. Annie, I'm sorry. I never wanted to give you the impression I was interested in any other girl. Is that why you've been acting distant to me? He asked. Annie simply said, Yeah. Jesse stopped the buggy and turned to Annie. He looked into her eyes. 
You are the only girl I have ever been interested in, and I can say that with a true heart. Annie wanted to believe his words with all her heart. Really? I've never noticed you even looking at me, and I haven't seen much of you lately. I don't need to look at you. I know what you look like. I've seen you almost every day of my life. His voice lowered to a softer tone as he whispered. I see you when I close my eyes at night. It felt like there were a million butterflies in Annie's tummy, and her face flushed with heat. She wished she could turn her eyes away, but he was staring intently into her eyes. He continued. At night, as I lay to sleep, I see your big brown eyes and your smooth, soft, honey-colored skin. Annie felt a huge lump in her throat and was lost for words. This was a side of Jesse she'd never seen. He was telling her things that she'd always hoped he'd say, but never thought that he would. She looked at his lips and wanted them to touch her own. She took a deep breath, knowing she had to be strong and not let lustful thoughts get the better of her. Annie saw him looking at her lips as well, and she knew that he was thinking the same thing as she. I haven't been to see you or your family too much lately, only because I've been busy building up my business. Annie felt really silly the way that she'd jumped to all sorts of conclusions, but Liz had said she liked a horse dealer, and the only man she knew who did that was Jesse. Then a thought occurred to her. Perhaps Ephraim was now dealing in horses as well. Perhaps that's why he was at the horse auction and knew all the ins and outs of everything. He also knew everyone who ran the auction really well. Annie suddenly stopped her line of thinking. She didn't want to waste these precious moments with Jesse by thinking of Ephraim. Now I best get you home. Jesse put his attention to the road and headed to Annie's house. All the way home, Annie felt as if a light had been switched on inside her. Could it be this easy? Jesse likes me just as I like him. Somehow, Annie thought that it was all too good to be true. Is true love always so easy like this? She wondered. As they pulled up to the house, Jesse turned to her and said, I've most likely waited too long to say this because I wasn't sure of your feelings, but my heart belongs to you and only you, Annie. Those were the words that Annie had wanted to hear for so long. Suddenly, Annie felt a little embarrassed and her gaze fell from his eyes. With one finger under her chin, Jesse tilted her face up toward him until their eyes locked together. Every time I'm away from you, all I can do is think of when I will look into your beautiful eyes once more. Annie swallowed hard and wanted to look away. No, I always look away or I always walk away. This time I will follow my heart and open my heart. I will keep looking into Jesse's eyes and will not be the first to look away. Marry me, Annie. Annie could not suppress her delight any longer, and a glow of happiness filled her body. Of course I will, Jesse. I would love nothing more than to be your wife. Jesse picked up one of Annie's hands. He slowly raised it to his mouth and pressed his lips against it. One more thing I have to say is that the only woman who is pleasing to my eyes and makes my heart glad when I look at her is you, Annie Miller, soon to be Annie Yoder. Annie giggled with delight as he picked up her other hand and pressed that hand to his lips as well. You have been listening to Annie's Faith, written by Samantha Price, narrated by Susanna Coleman, copyright 2014 by Samantha Price. Production copyright 2023 by Samantha Price.